You're listening to Find the Good News, Episode 31, The Windblown Seed, featuring Adley Cormier. This episode of Find the Good News is sponsored by Parker Brand Creative Services, a branding agency that thinks sideways, pushes forward, and gets your brand up. Check out our work at parkerbrandup.com. Next week's episode features Catholic blogger, writer, and speaker Diana Vallette. Buckle up because this episode is a little longer than most of them. Diana and I share the Catholic faith. We find a lot of common ground, but we've come at our faith from different directions, which I think is really lovely. There's a lot of openness and honesty in our talk, and I think you're going to get into uh, get into some territory that maybe you didn't think we would go. If you're into that sort of thing, then tune into this episode. The week after that, I'll be posting a conversation that's 25 years in the making with my high school speech teacher and mentor, Alita Barnes. It was a personal treat to me, and I hope that you'll get a taste of the special woman that really helped make a hinge in my life. Following that, I've got Jeremy Boudreaux, Devin Morgan, and Rusty Havens, three gents coming at good works from different angles right here in our community. I'm really looking forward to all three of those visits. And then this month, I'll be having the Mixtape Roundtable. I'm excited for that talk, but I'm really excited to see how it turns out. This is something new for Find the Good News. I've got some cool things in store to help generate some really great conversations between Paul Gonsalon, Rosie Pryor, and Elizabeth McDaniel, and myself. I'll keep you posted as we move closer to that episode's launch date. In the last episode, I mentioned that I'll be producing some road trip episodes of Find the Good News. Well, I have several of those lining up, and I'll be doing my first travel visit this coming week. I'm excited to see how these are going to go. I can't wait to share all that multimedia with you guys. This is going to be a a more content-rich format for us, so just keep your uh, ears and eyes open for any information I post about that on social media. Look, this show is intended to be a Chautauqua. Now, that's a word that I pulled from the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So if you don't know what it means, look it up. But that can only happen if you, the listener, participate. So that's why I've set up the Good News Listener Hotline. You can call the show, leave thoughts, feedback, questions, topics, criticisms, really whatever you like. If your message can be worked into the show, then I'll discuss them with the folks that are on the show with me. Don't be shy. I received some really great feedback through Facebook and Instagram, but the listener hotline is something that you can do to really get involved with the show. So call the Good News Listener Hotline at 802-459-1668. That's 802-459-1668. You can also text that number. That number is available on the website as well at findthegood.news along with all of the uh, most current episodes of the show. What really helps are reviews and recommendations. Whatever app you're using to listen to Find the Good News, even if you listen directly on Facebook or YouTube, give the episode you're listening to a like, a rating, a review, and make sure to subscribe to the show. You'll get notifications about new episodes and other content, and it's going to help keep the show free. And if you use a good news advertiser, someone that you hear on this show, then let them know that you heard about them on Find the Good News. That's a huge help to me in this endeavor to bring you positive, thought-provoking, and heart-moving content. Your ears, minds, hearts, and feedback mean the world to me. Keep sending that in and keep listening to this show. I'll keep visiting with good people and sharing your stories. Now let's get to what you tuned in for and press play on a little good news. I had no idea what was in store for me the day that local historian and author of Lost Lake Charles, Adley Cormier, sat down in my vehicle to do a ride-along as part of a historic tour project in Lake Charles, Louisiana. At every stop, corner, street, and alley, Adley had some information or intimate knowledge. I was fascinated by how quickly he could reveal the history of seemingly insignificant places and landmarks, pointing out interesting and forgotten details that brought me back in time. I left that ride along wanting to hear more. Though many years had passed since we'd spoken, I wanted to get Adley on Find the Good News and continue that conversation. When I made the request, Adley enthusiastically agreed. That's the thing that I enjoyed most about our conversation, his enthusiasm. When he speaks of Southwest Louisiana history, there is an energy, a joy, and honesty that makes the spaces come to life. Adley moves time backward and forward with ease, bringing you to the Spanish Louisiana coast when the Acadians arrived, 
on to the business exploits of the infamous privateer Jean Lafitte through the Great Lake Charles Fire. These are the legendary people and events we've all heard of, the tales we think we know. But Adley reveals in a minutia of details, tiny things, sprinkled throughout our history, binding one thing to the other, an infinite number of dominoes falling in every direction, building a chain of events that affect the lives of each person living in our region today. His uncanny ability to pull threads between seemingly disconnected moments in local history is really something to behold. Adley sees the web that weaves through the timeline and how it affects every generation in turn. When you get a glimpse of it from Adley's perspective, you want to see more. What he shares helps generate a sense of place, culture, value, and honestly, tolerance. When we know where we come from, we can see that we are not all that different from others. For me, that's one of the first steps in generating understanding. That's one of the gifts of Adley's willingness to share. I'm glad that history put Adley and I together for that ride along all those years ago. That one little moment in my personal history led to Adley sharing his good news with me, and now I get to share that with you. Wake up, it's morning, you're dreaming up a story I can hear the way it's going, cause you're laughing in your sleep on the path to your deliverance and a holy wall of light pouring through your window. Old news, bad I'm news, happy, fake news. Sometimes Help you just want to shut it all I down and get no news at all. With Find the Good News, I aim to change that by focusing on good people doing good work. I visit with artists, educators, civic and spiritual leaders, musicians, business owners, students, volunteers, and everyday citizens who are using their creativity, resources, and talents to bring hope and happiness to their corner of the world. In each episode, I dig into the hearts and minds of my extraordinary guests. We have street-level conversations about relatable things going on in their lives, discover the critical life experiences that shape them, the perspectives that drive them, and the fundamental beliefs that are anchoring them to a path of goodness. There's a lot of news in the world. My name is Orrin Parker, and I'm going to find the good. And I love you just. of No Man's Land. Yeah, we did the logo for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, did you? Yeah, oh, sure did. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we came up with the notion. I was a consultant really? for that project, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, because it, trying to decide on how you make No Man's Land a positive twist, twist because it's, a, it's a, a very difficult concept. No Man's Land sort of like, oh, my, what are we going to do? Well, No Man's Land, nobody wanted to go there, or No Man's Land, why yeah. would you want to go there? Sure. So coming up with a positive notion was difficult, so that the Becoming Louisiana, difficult. yeah, it was difficult. So the Becoming Louisiana motif is is good, because it, it actually had to become Louisiana, rather than just claimed as Louisiana. Well, it's interesting, because uh, after my father, you know, passed away, we we got to talk and my family's from de quincey and my last name's parker you know and that's a pretty common name up in that neck of the woods mm -hmm. and uh my uncle we got to talking you know where's our family come from because we really never hear stories about that mm. and he got to telling us a story had directly related to no man's land he yeah. said that uh our family was um let's see there and the way he tells it is there was mr parker and mr parker's wife and he had his two sons but then in the community they lived in in mississippi there was uh, a fire or an accident or something and their neighbors the mother and father died so mr parker and his wife adopted the two boys mm -hmm. right and these two boys they raised them as parkers but they weren't really parkers but Mr. Parker got in a land dispute with somebody over a railroad track or something to that degree. He kills the guy. They up and take off to no man's land. No man's land. Yeah. And then our family, that's where we come from. So we don't know if we're from Mr. You're, Parker's directly or the two genetic, adopted yeah, boys. Genetically Parker's. Connected or. What's that? You don't know if you're connected with the neighbors? Or uh, no, or we don't the, know. The that's right. Well, that's interesting, though. That's interesting. Of course, it, it, it'll boil down to the, you know, the DNA eventually if yeah. that ever happens. But uh, it's one of the many, many colorful stories that you have in No Man's Land because it was a place where if you wanted to have a new beginning, this is where you came to get that new beginning. Sort of like Australia in the, sure. you know, in the... 
in the early 20th century. That's fascinating. I mean, yeah, well, it is because you don't actually have that as a a real formal thing in in terms of the United States. Uh, The United States has pretty much been a you know claim and conquer sort of thing. We claim it. This is our flag. This is ours. Our law prevails. But with the no man's land agreement, and it was actually agreement between Herrera and uh, Wilkinson, it was sort of like, well, we're not going to bother with those people down there, so they can pretty much live on their own, which meant you, if you wanted protection, you brought your own. Ah. And it, it meant a lot of things for a lot of different people. For folks from the upland south and the lowland south, it was a place to get a new start. For some of the escaped uh, slaves that came here, it was it was a lot closer than trying to get all the way up to Canada. Ah, you know? okay. So we have, that's why we have, uh, in places like Choate's Prairie and Mossville and so forth, when, when the American authority actually became you know, solidified here after the no man's land era, you already had well established areas of, of freed blacks. I see. That had been able to escape from plantations along the Tesh Valley or. Kind of re- restart right here. In right. This. They okay. restarted here. And uh, because their masters knew that if they went to no man's land, they were going to have to bring their own whole posse in order to do that. And wow. it wasn't done. So uh, there, there's some of that. I mean, there are they're not huge in numbers, but the thing is, there were established free black communities here when the white man, when American white supremacy right flag you know planted the the flag and it, it made it a little bit different because this is not what you ordinarily expect in south louisiana no that's not i'm actually yeah. fascinated to hear that i didn't know any of that yeah yeah the history of uh, mossville and uh which was choate's prairie and there were other i mean the you have to remember imperial calcio was very very large and the part of imperial calcio that was part of no man's land was about half of it so you're looking at about five thousand square miles of of no man's land and uh, a good uh, 3,000 square miles of it was Imperial Calcutta Parish. Some of it was up in Vernon and, okay. and all the way up to the Sabine because it was sort of a sort of an oddly shaped wedge sort of thing between the Calcutta and the Sabine. Interesting. And so some of that no man's land area goes over, was over in Texas, what we consider uh, Texas. Uh, well, now. actually more, it, 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 Texas actually, their claims were to the Sabine River. They were pretty consistent. Oh, okay. Sabine River is, is where it was. Uh, the, the, the problem was the Louisiana Purchase only actually connected land that was directly drained and connected to the Mississippi River. Okay. So the Atchafalaya is connected to, to that. The Red is connected to the Mississippi. Uh, 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 Bayou Tash is connected. So that was all clear. That that part of Louisiana was very clearly in the Louisiana Purchase. But once you get past, um, um, let's say, Scott or Lafayette, you begin to, the, the watershed changes and you have the Mermentau and the Decon and the Calcasieu River and so forth. And that, that area was not connected to the Mississippi, not drained by the Mississippi. So it was not, it was, there was a very solid reason for why in the hell is, what is this ours? Is this still Spain? Yeah. And it, that was where the conflict began. I see. Because okay. the purchase was very not clear. Uh, uh, Napoleon sold all lands drained by the Mississippi River. And that meant all the lands, I mean, all the way up into Alberta, really. Al- really? Part of that Alberta. Far? Yeah, Alberta, yeah. I mean, it's all of Montana, Alberta, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota. A lot of places are drained that way. And the red drains that way. So that was, that was uh, part of the purchase. But then when you get to this part of Louisiana, we're not connected to the Mississippi at all. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I didn't think about that, yeah, really. It, it's, that- it's, it's, the, it, it's where political plumbing... <laughs> makes a difference. <laughs> Political That's a good plumbing. way to put it. Political and, and that was plumbing. the way it was. And, you know, sure, the history of Southwest Louisiana is very fascinating because it doesn't connect with the history of the rest of the state pretty much at all. Um, and um, it's uh, it's an interesting place. And the no man's land concept for this part of Louisiana, west of the Calcasieu, uh, is, uh, is always been very close to my heart because it, there's so many unusual uh, uh, sources for the folks who lived here. Um, are you familiar with Texians? No. Okay, well, let me tell you about Texians. Texians were folks who had been promised by people like um, Austin and Houston uh, that they would make fortunes in Texas. They So come into Texas, which at that point in time was a province of Mexico. Okay. On the it, uh, Actually, they were fighting against Spain to get their independence, but it was a province of Mexico. 
And there were American settlers there because it had a fabulous cotton lands available for cotton. And cotton was the big motivating factor in, in, in the antebellum period of, Louis, of, of the United States. So uh, you had these uh, Americans who were living in Spanish Texas, encouraging people to come to Spanish Texas in order to to um, uh, make their fortunes. Yeah, and uh, they were selling land. They'd gotten land grants from the Spanish Crown. They're getting, and the the problem is uh, these immigrants, if you will. Yeah, uh, there were friction with the the native Spanish speaking people who were there, and the the, the, the some French speaking people there too, and they got very discouraged because they weren't getting what they were promised. Okay. And so many of them came back into no man's land to settle. They were Texans. Okay. They came back. People like uh, some of the the Perkins, which is a family in your neck. Yeah, of the that's and, right. And, that's right. You know, uh, Perkins, the cowards. Okay. Uh, the geniuses all came back. They they were from Mississippi. They were from uh, North Carolina. They were promised uh, this wonderful uh, future in Texas. They went to Texas. Uh, you know, they left the United States, went to Texas, started, and they were very discouraged and they came back. So these Texians, as we call them, yeah. came back into, and they were part of the settlement pattern here. In addition to the people who were already here, you know, you had a few French and Spanish, uh, people like Bartholomew Le Bleu and, you know, and so forth. And then you had American settlement settlers here that also came in, the Ryan's and the uh, the uh, uh, some of the Perkins, a different family of Perkins, but you know you had those. So you had you have this odd mix, and then you had the Acadians on top of all of that who came this yeah. far west as they were, you know filled up the lands along the uh, Bayou Teche and Bayou Vermilion, and they were pushed more to the west because you know the, the, the good land was being taken up by the big. Uh, cotton and cane plantations that were being set up so the small farmers that were being sort of pushed out uh were were pushed out to, to this corner and so you had a lot of um, unusual um sources for the people of western louisiana and uh, that makes for a, a real interesting match you know listening to you talk this is exactly why i wanted to have you on this show because i don't know if you remember when we did the historic tour app for the mm-hmm. convention visitors bureau mm-hmm. that's where i met you mm-hmm. and uh out of all the things we did for that app which you know we shot a lot of video and and dealt with the editing part but the biggest joy i got out of that whole thing was getting to ride around with you before we actually went and shot that app and yeah. you pointed things out and really a lot of little details that didn't end up in the tour it was mm-hmm. the small stuff and one thing that really stuck out to me was you talked about i believe tin pin alley tin pin alley yeah tin pin alley is a cool part of uh, uh, sort of an unknown part of of lake charles it's the uh the public um uh, alley between the secular part of of Lake Charles on that block, and the the church is part of that block. Yeah. Uh, the, and for your listeners or viewers or however you want to phrase this, uh, we're talking about the south part of the block, um, which is uh, bordered by Ryan and Pujo and Bilbo and Kirby. Uh, the very corner of that that property uh, on the east southeast edge is the cathedral which is yeah. undergoing renovation right now but at one time that whole southern part of the block was church property and uh, the original Catholic church in in Lake Charles um, uh, was on that property but facing the uh, the uh, courthouse and there was a a a convent and a a priest's house and also a school st charles academy started uh, out there as early as uh, the 1860s Uh, by 1888 they actually had a very nice building they were teaching teaching girls in that uh, that school and all of that burned up in the great fire of 1910 it it, it all went and uh, the uh, the story goes that the uh pastor of the church uh, uh, Monsignor Cramner had to go to Europe to get money to to borrow to build the church and he borrowed from the bankers that he knew there he had been from the, the low countries and he uh, they actually mortgaged the land really when 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 the bankers asked him and this is the way the story goes now i can't say that it's 100 <laughs> percent folks of the cathedral might might uh, be surprised by this but i don't think they're they are uh when they asked the bank when the bankers asked was this good land he said yes it was land flat enough that you could bowl 10 pins 
Ah. And so the, the, <laughs> the alley, which divides the, the western part of the land, which is what they actually sold, it put it to commerce so that they could build the cathedral, uh, that boundary is called Tinpin Alley. And it's still maintained by the city of Lake Charles. Uh, but, I mean, I would think probably... 99 people out of 100 don't even know where it is but sure. Tinpin Alley is is that boundary between the secular and the the uh, the, the profane if you will the well civil, sure because uh, that's right there where the Phoenix building yeah, is yeah the right? Phoenix building is, is to the west and the uh, the rectory for the cathedral is to the east and there's a little alleyway there there are actually some Louisiana iris and some cypress trees planted there it was a little bit of an improvement uh, way back when I was on the DDA that was one of the first things that we did we improved Tenpin Alley yeah. because we wanted it to be a connector a pedestrian connector between the, the uh, 1911 City Hall and the um the uh, Pioneer Building, which is currently City Hall in Lake Charles, um, which at one time was uh, an office building. See, everything kind of connects to other things. Sure. The, uh, the Pioneer Building was begun as essentially Lake Charles' answer to Maurice Hyman's oil center in Lafayette. Oh, really? Did you know that? No, I did not know that. It was built by Wildcatters, oil people, a fellow by the name of Mardello Vincent and Lee Welch built the Pioneer Building because they saw what Maurice Hyman was doing with uh, his old orange orchard in Lafayette and he was providing places for all the exploration companies to set up. This is in the um, late 40s, early 50s. All of this was happening at the same time in both Lake Charles and Lafayette. A lot of exploration in oil. And so uh, uh, they decided that they were going to build this tower that they were going to just fill with exploration companies and engineering companies and so forth. So they, they actually set this the, the whole thing up and uh, went with a kind of a modern looking building. I mean, it's a mid-century building. It's a really good example of that uh, sort of prairie style. And uh, they never had a grand opening because really? they, as the floor was finished, it, they'd loaded up with offices all the way up. And it was packed with, with business for a long time until the late 70s when they finally kind of cleared out. The oil industry sort of decided Lafayette was where they were going to be. Sure. And we were going to be on the production end of things. But... Uh, it was originally a, an oil, uh, like Charles' version of the oil center was going to be a vertical thing. Kind of that, cool that's notion. fascinating. And, you know, somebody uh, somebody said this about you and listening to you talk. I'm like, you know, again, it was something I only got to experience that one time on that trip. Uh, I love how you said that one story connects to the other, each, each by geography. And what she said was that you're the uh, you're the historic Google of Lake Charles. <laughs> <laughs> well, the story goes, cool. yeah, well, I, a lot of work, I do a lot of work for the Convention Visitors Bureau. They're very, very proactive in trying to develop an identity for this corner of Louisiana. And it's tough. It really is tough because there's a really, really strong identity in Louisiana in New Orleans. New Orleans is what people think of as Louisiana. And there's a really strong identity in, in Cajun country. And Cajun country is, is I'm, I'm from Cajun country. I'm from Burr Bridge. Je parle français. You wouldn't think it, but I do. And uh, it, it's a fascinating place. And we're right on the edge of that. We're, but we're where the Cajuns meet the Creoles, meet the Texans, meet the Germans, meet the English. Uh. We're on that end. And... Um, uh, in order to develop an identity, you have to know what the history is in order to, to get an idea of what are we about. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're the, 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 the outback of Louisiana. We're the, the uh, not necessarily the no man's land, but the place you come to get new starts, new beginnings. And, and how, that's, that's a positive thing. And Yeah, no, exactly. That's a, as you say that, I think how relevant in our world today, there's so much discussion about immigration and asylum seekers and, and people that are escaping conflicts and trying to migrate to new lands where they can be safe listening to you tell this history you know this is what humans do this is very natural for humans to do this to exactly. blend cultures exactly. and learn from each other and, and it provides particularly here it provides a really colorful basis if you know the history it's a very colorful basis uh, it's uh, it's uh, the only place i know of on the american continent where you actually have an interaction between cowboys and pirates <laughs> yeah. you know, 
<laughs> you wouldn't think Cowboys might, but you actually have that here because many of the early settlers in in uh, on the Calcasieu Prairie raised cattle. This okay. was open range land, and open range land means that we did not have uh, cotton culture, we did not have cane culture, we did not have big white plantation houses with with uh, you know six hundred slaves doing doing yeah, the that's heavy not labor. what was going on. That here. was not what was going on here. Uh, you might have um, uh, somebody like the Le Blues or or uh, Charles Salier that essentially operated small sustaining farms and then they raised cattle on the open prairies and then they would drive their cattle to the markets eastward. The markets were in St. Martinville, Opelousas, and in New Orleans eventually. And the cattle drives went that way. And these cattle drives actually predate the Texas cattle drives, you know, the raw really? hide, get yeah. them up cattle drive by 100 years because the cattle drives begin in the, in the uh, late 1700s and it wasn't until the 1870s uh, before you had cattle drives that went north-south from Texas to to uh, to Kansas. So anyway, you have cattle industry here and you have uh, people like uh, Salier who have these cattle and uh, you know, you, have, you can convert cattle into meat, you can go convert cattle into uh, hides and you know you have something to trade with sure and so when Jean Lafitte and his guys come sailing into southwest Louisiana because it's no man's land they could operate in the open here uh, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, remember they could operate yeah. in the open so they they come here they would trade so you think of you think of, of the Jean Lafitte oh you know it's not the Jack Sparrow Pirates of the <laughs> right. Caribbean sort of thing. It's think of more like the uh, sort of the UPS man and Amazon, if you will. Okay. Because if you yeah. needed if you needed wine or if you needed gunpowder, if you needed uh, dishes, pots and pans, uh, you know, as well as gold and silver, you got it from Lafitte because he he had, he had the market. I mean, he controlled according to 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 um, to. Uh, William Claiborne, who was the first governor of Louisiana, the last ter territorial governor, the first state governor of Louisiana, uh, Jean Lafitte uh, operated about 25% of all business in the lower Mississippi Valley. Wow. It was black market, yeah. essentially. No yeah. tariffs, no questions asked. You know, oh, you need some, some, some pork, you need some burgundy, you need some whiskey, I can get it for you. So think of fulfillment center. Uh, yeah. Than, Do you know that's a great way to put that? I mean, it puts it in a whole new light. I just hear you it say does. that. So when you see a pirate flag in southwest Louisiana, you think, oh, well, let me get those cattle because I can trade some cattle for some rum and I can get, yeah. you know, or some pots, dishes, guns, whatever I need because we're not on a cash economy, really, in southwest Louisiana. We're still, you know, at this point in time, and we're talking about the late. 1700s, early 1800s. So you're talking about trade. Trade. It's all it's trade. It's trade. It's trade. Essentially trade. And um, uh, it's uh, it's always been interesting that that the you know the oldest pirate festival, which used to be contraband days, now they call it pirate festival. I don't know if that's an improvement in, in terminology, but it actually deals with that. It's actually a proactive entre. You know, we're talking about sale and water-based entrepreneurial action in the bayous and marshes of southwest louisiana that's what we're celebrating right we celebrate. right you know uh, it can get muddled up in other well, ideas yeah because you know you think of the pirates of the caribbean and that's a completely different notion jean lafitte himself never never called himself a pirate he was a privateer he actually privateer. had a letter of mark a letter of mark uh was a letter actually granted by a government the united states can al also offer letters of mark we had our own privateers uh, you were given a permission to uh, to board enemy vessels and take their stuff, essentially. <laughs> legal piracy. Yeah, legal piracy. <laughs> and uh, the letters of mark were issued by many countries. Um, uh, the United States has a whole section on, on issuing letters of mark, so it's it's something that is actually a, a form of politics. Uh, Lafitte's letter of mark was from Cartagena, which was in New Spain, uh, which was in what is now Colombia, Cartagena in Colombia. And uh, he had connections there. The deal with, with Lafitte was that none of his stuff ever went Went to Cartagena. It was recycled in Louisiana. He took your stuff and he sold it to somebody else. Yeah. Uh, so yes, he was. I mean, it was. He didn't uh, rob from the rich and give to the poor. Essentially, is rob from the rich and sell it to the poor. Sure. And then um, and then make a living a, a, along the way. So uh, that's 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 uh, you know we're talking about a fairly uh, a fairly practical pirate here uh, or practical privateer. But he did maintain that he was a, a, a privateer, not a pirate, but a privateer. He had his letter of mark, uh, although uh, Cartagena. And it, it, this is the other bizarre thing about, about Lafitte. Uh, we know a lot about him from the time that he was uh, coerced into 
not chorus, but he'd worked with uh, Adrian Jackson for the Battle of New Orleans and for several years on either side of that. But his early days and his latter days are totally unknown. It's all conjecture because he didn't leave much in the way of records. So, so, yeah, I watched a documentary. Uh, one of my favorite explorers is on uh, the, the Travel Channel, Joshua Gates, mm-hmm. and uh, he did an episode about him, and I was fascinated by how many holes there were and how much of it was just... It's conjecture. I mean, what we know about, about Jean Lafitte is essentially what the authorities want us to know about Jean Lafitte. Uh, you know, they say, oh, he's bad, he did this, he did that, he did this. But, uh, you know, in terms of anything from his side, we don't really have much, you know, he didn't leave a whole lot of paper trail. Let me just say that. It's a yeah. well, I mean, figure. that's the way you have to be. I mean, how could you possibly leave paper trail when, when you're actually subject to being caught and hanged? Well, uh, sure. You know. And then a figure like Lafitte, I mean, how much does that change the culture, too? I mean, what are they bringing in and out of an area? Well, you know? what they're bringing in and out of the area as far as southwest Louisiana goes and because we're so remote and I mean remote um, uh, he was bringing in essentially the day-to-day things you needed to have in order to live okay and uh, we're talking uh, you had to have uh, guns you had to have gunpowder you had to have uh, um, pots and pans uh, f- I mean furniture and jewelry you know there are all sorts of tales the stuff of uh, life uh, textiles yeah. you know all sorts of things that you needed to have in order to live we did not have established uh, retail outlets uh, at that point, and Joe Lafitte was one of the folks that provided that. I mean, there were also itinerant pen- peddlers that would come in and, and do, but the deal is, Jean Lafitte was able to get the best stuff. I mean, he had access to all the ships and the Gulf and the Upper Caribbean. So yeah. There were. And he ran, actually, it was a, a sort of a corporate empire, if you will, because it wasn't just Jean Lafitte. It was Jean and his, his brother Pierre, along with a, about 20 um, lieutenants that operated their own vessels that f- were working for Lafitte. Okay. Uh, there were also what we call barracoons, which were uh, the uh, essentially warehouses and the shipyards and the dormitories where folks worked actually maintaining the stuff that he stole. He had, the first barracoon was in Barataria. The second uh, uh, one, he was actually chased out of New Orleans about 1818 uh, he set up a base in Galveston uh, called Campeche and that was the other big base but there was a barracoon at, on contraband by one at Nimblitz Bluff and these were little settlements operated by the, the this pirate corporation if yes. you will and, and uh, it, you know men were stationed there to protect the stuff and trade with the locals and to take things in you know they would take in things like uh, uh, frankly things like feathers and uh, oysters and cattle and you know uh, hides and whatnot and uh, um, uh, they processed that stuff through and sold that on and then did with uh, you know handled the other goods that, that were being uh, supplied to the residents of southwest Louisiana now, you have to admit, this was fairly sparse numbers on the ground. We're not talking about a huge, we're not talking about 150,000 people. We're talking, you know, probably fewer than, than 3,000 people in in, Cal- in all of Imperial Calcutta. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're not talking about a lot of people. We're talking about fairly sparse. But it, 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 it is interesting, and that's one of the components that make this corner of Louisiana so interesting. So, Adley... I mean, there's so many stories that have a beginning, right? I mean, and just listening to you, you can go from one thing to the other and and, and drill back and, and really keep going back to the, the beginning of a story. And then you can even take that story and go back to another beginning. Mm. Where does that start for you? Like, where do you get your interest in this? And where did that? Where did that begin? Well, yeah. uh, first off, uh, I was, uh, I'm from Burbridge. Okay. And in Burbridge uh, and, and very close to St. Martinville, you live with history all around you i mean literally you can uh, i know where my great great grandparents are buried and you know you you have the family stories there because the uh, part of the acadian culture begins in south louisiana in the in the uh, 1760s 1770s and pretty much continues on of course the acadians as you well know had an established culture in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick. Uh, They had been there for 150 years when the British decided in 1755 to literally kick them out. Yeah. It was a form of ethnic cleansing. They cleaned out the, they wanted to 
seize these lands. They use the pretext of them not willing to swear allegiance to the crown, which was a fiction. Uh, in fact, uh, a fellow not too terribly long ago, uh, 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 Warren Perrow from uh, Abbeville actually got a, a, an apology from the Queen of really? England for doing that. Yeah, wow. yeah, he had been pursuing that for a long time. Anyway, um, uh, the um, the Acadian culture, uh, which was essentially the northern French people, maritime people who had settled in the eastern uh, provinces of Canada, had been there since the 1600s, before the pilgrims came to the United States before they were there they had a, a well-established culture uh, beginning in, in 1755 the British began seizing their lands and they would literally just uh, bring a boat up separate men and, and, and boys into one boat and women and girls into another and then just send the boats out and they would seize the lands and they were repopulating uh, it, to some extent, they were repopulating Scots uh, onto the eastern colonies in order to relieve the pressures of the Scottish that were uh, rebelling against the the uh, the uh, English uh, from the Battle of Culloden. It, uh, so, the Scotch history and uh, you, you know, U.S. history, Canadian history, English history, French history all kind of blends at this point. But mm. in any case, uh, they were giving those lands to to the Scots. And that's why it's called Nova Scotia, New Scotland. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I thought. But anyway, the French were there first. The, the Acadians were there. And uh, the Acadians had a, a very pleasant existence there. They actually served an interesting point um, because, uh, I don't know if you know the geography of, of that part of Canada, but the Bay of Fundy is the, the big element there. And Bay of Fundy has the enormous tidal changes. And because of that, the native uh, Indians in, in uh, eastern Canada, the Mi'kmaq Indians, yeah. was the big tribe there, um, they actually had a fear of the, the ocean because of the tidal bore being so extensive. Uh -huh. They loved fish, but they did not themselves fish. They did not live close to that. It was viewed as sacred and spooky land. So the Acadians, uh, essentially, who were very good fishermen and hunters and everything else, uh, served as an intermediary. The Acadians would fish, they would trade with the Indians, and they would. It was there was a very good connection, interconnection between the Native Americans and the Acadians. They served that interesting uh, bridge I for see, that particular. Okay. I mean, uh, just a quirk of history. Um, in fact, when the in, when the English would come for some of the early from my ancestors, some of them were taken in by the Mi'kmaq Indians, and they were hidden away with Mi'kmaqs. That's why they're still Acadian. Interesting. So yeah. Yeah. This, what you're talking about, and I'm not going to segue too far into this, but the only reason I know I'm hearing things that I'm a little familiar with is because of my interests in Oak Island uh, and all of that area and the Mi'kmaq mm. Indians. And there's so much conjecture about what's happened there. It's so mysterious. But a lot of what you're saying does connect oh, with some does. of that. It's, it's, all, it's all Everybody's history is interconnected with everybody else's Yeah, it's history. fascinating. It. But anyway, <laughs> when, the, uh, when, uh, when the Acadians were put on these boats, when they were separated by sex and put on these various boats, um, the boats were, would go, I mean, they were just going in different directions. And Acadians uh, would, uh, they were sent down the coastline. And if they went to a, a colony like Massachusetts, they were told, don't get off here, buddy. Really? Keep on. Uh, there are some Acadians in hmm. Maryland because Maryland was a Roman Catholic colony at the time, so some there. There are a few. Um, there are a few uh, Acadian families in um, in uh, South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina. Charleston took in a few um, uh, that said that there were there was a Huguenot population there, so the Huguenots uh, spoke French, so there was a little connection there. Okay. But there were Acadians that went as far as the Falkland Islands in really? the dispersal. Yeah, they were sent all over the place. They were just sent. Go, leave. Just broken like those refugees. Uh, yeah, I mean. eventually some Acadians got to the, which was at that time the, the Spanish colony of, of Louisiana, and they were accepted in the Spanish colony of Louisiana, uh, although they were not particularly uh, housed in New Orleans. They were sent upriver to what is called the, uh, the German coast, uh, St. James, St. John, uh, Ascension parishes upriver. But even then they were pushed further west towards the the. the Tesh Valley and towards uh, 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 Voiles Parish and, okay. and, and so forth. They were pushed further because there were already there were settlers there already, and uh, you're dealing with a, essentially a peasant culture that had been in in Canada for a while. That didn't really go with the plantation economy that was developing in in those areas. So you have that that little bit of a change. And I'm happy. I know it. 
you're like me, then you've got a long wish list of things you need to do around your house. Things you just can't get to. It's not that I don't want to do them, but between my responsibilities at work, producing this show, and squeezing in some valuable mental downtime, I can't seem to get around to fixing the small stuff, and the big stuff is just waiting in line. To be honest, it kind of stresses me out. Maybe you're stressing out too. Well, stress no more because I've got good news. My friend, Ben Von Duke, has started a handyman service, and he takes the mystery out of getting these things done. Ben Von Duke is not just some guy that calls himself handy. He knows what he's doing, and he knows a whole lot. Not only is he an experienced and professional carpenter, but he's kind of a duke of all trades. What I love is that he's created an a la carte price list of services so you don't have to worry about getting in your pockets too deep before you're ready. He'll fix your running toilet, install appliances, replace fixtures, install ceiling fans, repair sheetrock and concrete, and a whole lot more than that. Look, I'm not too proud to say this, but sometimes it takes me three times as long to fix something because I've got to get online and search videos just to figure out what tools I need. Then I have to go buy the tools that I don't have and then kind of sort of come home and do the job. I don't have to do that anymore because Ben Von Duke will do it and do it better. On top of all that, he's just a good person, someone you can trust. He's honest, he's kind, and those are things that I value highly, and I bet you do too. You can get a hold of Ben Von Duke, the Duke of all trades, the good old-fashioned way, by using the phone. Call or text Ben at 337-540-1355. That's 337-540-1355. One three five five. He'll send you his service and price list, and trust me, his prices are more than fair. And do me a favor: when you do message Ben at three three seven five four zero one three five five, tell him you heard about the Duke of All Trades on Find the Good News. Anyway, the Acadians finally get to hear, you know, west the western edge of the Calcasieu Prairie because. This is where they had to go. I mean, there was literally no place else for them to go. They they had sort of been, you know, scooched all over the coastline of North America. Some went back to France. Some went back to France and then came back to the United States. I mean, they were in in a great dispersal. It's called the Grand Derangement. It's, oh, okay. it's called in French the Great Dispersal because they really the the British notion was to actually just get rid of these people. And that this was the, the first example of this this happening. Uh, they also did something the British did, and, and uh, uh, it, it was proven. They also did things like give infected smallpox blankets to the women. So and you're talking about like a genocide it level. Was genocide. I mean, it that's was. What it it was. I, I don't have much good to say for the the English uh, policy in in uh, in uh, uh, eastern Canadian provinces. And well, the, you break people apart that. like that. Yeah. And then terrible. you know, I mean, you're, yeah. you're talking about destroying a whole culture. Oh, you, you are. Know. You are. And of course, the story is part of the. It's part of the memory of. Of the Acadian people, and it was part of the reason why the uh, uh, a friend of Longfellow, the uh, who was from St. Martinville, uh, named uh, uh, um, Albert Voorhees, gave the the sense memory to Longfellow. Longfellow wrote the poem Evangeline, ah, which tells that yeah. story. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, and it's, it's probably a little bit more flowery than the actual the actual reality of the situation but it, it was a story of, of, of dispersing a population throughout the world and uh, many of them settled here in South Louisiana and even this far west in South Louisiana so uh, because there are Acadians also in East Texas sure so there you are but anyway that's I don't know where we're going well with that, that there you, we are. where you were where's your your interest in history oh begins? my interest in yeah. history oh yes there we go <laughs> well I, I begin with I begin with that so I have these stories I have these tales it's still part of the sense memory of, of Southwest Louisiana of my family and um uh, uh, so I'm interested in this. You see, uh, you see the old churches. You see the old buildings in Burbridge and St. Martinville. Very scenic. And and back in, in when I was young, they were still there. Uh, many folkways were still there. Uh, uh, fast forward, uh, finish high school, go to LSU. Uh, I took history with T. Harry Williams, who was the, the uh, in his last years of teaching history. I was able to 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 uh, get some of his classes, and you really begin to think of the all of the things that that happened and all of the various interconnections that helped to make 
uh, Louisiana what it is and so you get really interested about where you are and how to read a place and how mm. to sense what what is actually going on here and and to, to to begin to explore all of the different influences that make this place different and special from every other place in the world sure and so when I when I finished the, the LSU when I graduated LSU came here you i'm interested in you know why is this the way it is uh -huh. and you start looking at the different you look at the you look at the geography i start with geography because that's the basis for for most settlement patterns you look at the geography and you think of it in terms of what are the what is the the growth of civilization the growth of culture on that particular patch of ground yeah and you have uh in the in the term the old lsu term what is the first latifundia well the first latifundia the first settlement pattern uh, uh in this corner of louisiana are the ishak indians the attackable okay. indians and of course okay well ishak attackable let's think of the stories well uh, from a childhood i heard of the attackables as being man eaters cannibals and they were oh, really? wild and, and, and that's part of the that's part of what we have but then you go beyond that and you realize that the the uh the french explorers french and spanish explorers that came through here uh, came in contact with the natchez and the chittimacha indians first and the natchez and chittimacha had uh enemies their enemies were the atacapa okay which they viewed as wild because they were more nomadic than the the uh chittimacha and the natchez actually had village structure very much the european style Vill they lived in villages they had pottery they they uh, they wove textiles you know it was very much on an english fashion but the 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 ishak were much more nomadic they didn't have settled villages so they were viewed as savages by the indians who were viewed as savages by, by the, the, okay. the europeans so That's interesting so they, they interesting. so they the uh, the the name even the name atacaba is the atacaba is not an ishak word uh the word atacaba means in chitamacha means man eater Really? So that yeah. so they got a bum rap from the get go because we were getting <laughs> the the English the, the the white man the European settler was getting his information from Indians that were already biased towards these Indians which Double were biased, on, yeah <laughs> that were living you know living wildly and they would see the Chittimacha field and they would see the the you know oh look there's some. Uh, there's some critters over there. We're going to go and get those critters. You know, they're growing them. We're going to get... So they had these raids and they, oh, savage, savage, you know, man yeah. eater. So they, they were victimized that way. Well, the Ishak have their own history. It's a, it's an oral history. They, they don't have any writing, but the Ishak, in telling their own story, tell this story, which is a little bit different. Uh, the Ishak uh, is a band. Uh, they're linguistic, linguistically, they're connected with the Aztec Indians okay. and the Apaches. Okay. So they are nomadic. They were season. They moved seasonal bands all over. They would hunt deer here. They would go and do oysters here. They would do so forth. So they moved around. They didn't have the the, the settled uh, communities. Um, they um, did have some rituals that involved bloodletting. And if in battle, they would eat little bits of of the of their foe to capture their their essence i see you okay. know and there are many rituals like that they they didn't i mean they didn't make a, a you know a chitamacha sandwich and eat it right it was more of a capturing their spirit or their energy captured, or their power right, or exactly. something okay but Dominance. that's where the the notions of the man eaters came up i see uh so uh, so here we have the we have the ishak culture filtered through the chitamachas and the natchez who are their natural enemies and the, the europeans meet them first so they take that on as the notion so but it it means that it, it in this wild remote corner of louisiana with not not a whole lot of resources because you have to remember most of southwest louisiana is essentially marshy prairie is what it boils down to and we only have trees along the waterways so you have you don't have a whole lot of resources here and and, and we actually had buffalo here at one point you know so we're more like the plains indians and than, but anyway you have these these roaming bands of, of ishak indians uh they had the sunset people which were were west of the sabine and the sunrise people which were east interesting yeah okay. so so they have their own history and it's a fascinating history so you start with that you start with that and then you look at, at the, that why did they live the way they live well they live the way they live because of the the topography that they were dealing with mm -hmm. there the soil here is not as rich as the soil in along the Tesh Valley 
uh, the, the Teche Valley, uh, Mississippi Valley have soils that are, I mean, you have 250 feet of topsoil. Yeah. rich topsoil that comes from Iowa and, and Nebraska and, and so forth so it's very very rich you could grow crops every year without having a problem here you have a problem growing crops it's too wet it's too uh, uh, the soil is not particularly rich so you have to it's your subsistence farming you're going to take advantage of, of anything that you see that you can take advantage of so that explains to me why the Ishak were you know developed a culture different from the Natchez because ah, there's from no the reason Chitimachi. to settle right, right? I mean yeah, yeah no reason to settle and you couldn't you would exhaust your resources very quickly if you decided to, to build a village here whereas the the uh the uh Chittimacha could have a village and 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 uh you know make their beautiful baskets and do all of the other things they need to do so there you are so you begin with the Ishaks, then you look at the the, the development of, of of exploration by the Europeans, and uh, yes, it's quite possible that we had very early explorations, but probably not because this is tough land to get through, truly tough land to get through, and there are no natural water connections except from the Gulf up, so you don't have the great uh, the great uh, investigations of the Mississippi River, the Joliet and Marquette and La Salle and all that sort of thing. That's all water-based exploration. Uh, the Spanish exploration, which is essentially forced marches, like Hernando de Soto's forced march in the in the 1500s, sort of bypasses this because the climate isn't very good. It's full of mosquitoes. And if you're a Spaniard, uh, you know, wearing uh, 60 pounds of armor and, <laughs> right. uh, you know, with lice and everything else, the last place you want to be is South Louisiana in the summer. Sure. So you have some of that. You, so a lot of these early explorers kind of bypass this area. They explored areas that were more rich, where there was more gold to be found or whatever. Whatever excuse you want to you want to come up with. So we're essentially isolated and and uh, sort of, um, of um, off to the side. And it proves that because when you get to the Louisiana Purchase, we're sort of off to the side. You I know, see, I'm yeah. not part of the Purchase. Uh, and, and, and politically, it even continues, you know, till today. I mean, there are folks in Baton Rouge that don't know that there's anything, in, you know, west of the Mississippi. Right, right. And, and uh, you know, we feel even in contemporary America, uh, Louisiana, that, that uh, western Louisiana is kind of... Uh, kind of uh, uh, of, um, unknown because it's you just pass through it. You know, if you're on your way to Houston, you pass through it, and that's about it. But I mean, it it has its own culture, it has its own its own rationale. But anyway, so I, I go with all of this, and you look at all the different influences, and then you look at the map, and you look at at things like street names in Lake Charles. Look at the street names of, yeah. of Lake Charles and Sulphur, and you'll see, oh, here's a Fitz and Ryder Road. Here's a Prater. Here's a Moling. Well, that's German. What the hell is that? <laughs> and then you, the, the rationale behind that, the fact that we had German settlers here in the, 18, in the 1840s, 1850s, brought by by uh, Goss, and then we have a second wave of German, German uh, settlers that come here in the 1880s when they come in because of uh, J.B. Watkins and the selling of Louisiana. And what do you mean the selling of Louisiana? Well, J.B. Watkins, because the land had always been open range, it's never been claimed. Yeah. So J.B. Watkins can come in and buy a million and a half acres of South Louisiana. And he does. Uh -huh. You know, because okay. he can. And he says, well, what am I going to do with all this? He figures, well, I'm going to turn it into the paradise on earth where you can have, I mean, you can do four crops. You can do this or that. You can you can grow on these wide prairies because they he viewed it as farmland. He visioned farmland uh -huh. and, and, and rather than just uh, the swamps. He brought in people to dig canals. He brought in people to teach uh, agronomy. He, he, uh, I mean, this is where Seaman Knapp comes in. This is where you have all of the, the investment in Southwest Louisiana because land finally becomes valuable enough to develop into all of these various things. So you have the those, those strings, you have the nap connection that, that draws out the agriculture in southwest Louisiana uh, that takes the cattle from, from just rangy cattle all the way up to uh, to a point where we have a, a, a swift plant packing uh, center. Uh, the pictures in, in, in the book, uh, it's a six-story thing that, that processes 1,200 head of cattle a, a year. You know, you think, oh, wow. You know, you have all of these, these strings that come yeah. out of that. You know, it's interesting. This has come up on, this is the third episode where this has come up. We've, we were talking about migratory patterns and we're talking about the difference between nomadic people and then agriculture and things like that. But, you know, as I'm listening to you and I'm trying to imagine this, it's all on this huge time scale. 
it's almost like we were a land where nature was sort of in charge. Nature was definitely And people in were moving around with, with nature presented, but then we hit a point where what you just where described, once, where now we can once, command it, Once right? we had access to the power offered by steam. Ah, okay. That's when the switch happens. Uh, it's, it's one thing to exploit timber industry if you're using a pit saw. Yeah. And let me explain what a pit saw was. The very earliest settlers here used pit saws. You dug a hole in the ground. Can you imagine? You'd probably be standing in water up to your knees. Yeah, bet. With a log on top of you, and you're sawing with a crosscut saw up and oh. down. Somebody at the top is pulling the saw up, and then you're sawing. You're and in so the you pit saw. So you've got a, a tree or a log. You're a tree on or top log, and you're pr- you're cutting it into 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 planks, and you're processing. Okay. You're processing raw tree into lumber. So someone's moving this through, and right. you're just you're yeah. basically right. you're the machine. Yes, you're the machine. You're doing that. <laughs> wow, that's to go crazy. from that. To what what uh, what uh, Locke did, what uh, Perkins did, what Bradley did, what all those early lumbermen did, in, introduced the steam engine, which processed the lumber with a circular saw. You know, in its ideal, the circular saw would continue to run until you had to change the blade because you could run that 300-year-old pine, 600-year-old cypress right through it and develop a product that would sell instantly. Because what we're facing at at this point, when we're talking about the the lumber industry moving from, it was total exploitation. You had these big trees that could not be gotten out very easily until you had the the steam powered mill to process it and to haul it out and to get it going. And you had ready markets out there. Uh, Galveston was the the big ready market for Southwest Louisiana. And a lot of the lumber went down the Calcasieu to the Gulf and then over to Galveston where it was sold. It was used in Galveston to build buildings, uh, but it was also sold throughout the Gulf Coast and through uh, the Caribbean because it was very good material. That's Once the railroads come in, it even we it, it even goes further. It goes out to the north and, and to the east because you are still getting out, uh, and we're talking about the, the 1880s, 1890s now, you're getting out 70-foot pieces of lumber that, you know, 6 by 6 and 12 by 6 for heavy construction. Uh, you're getting a lumber that, that uh, the cypress, which was able to withstand all sorts of, of weather and termites and whatnot. Uh, and this was prime, prime building material. Uh, one of the things that the, the Michigan men, the, the, uh, the uh, northerners who came to southwest Louisiana, and they went to other places too, but in Southwest Louisiana, they ran the lumber mills because there was still lumber to be gotten, and uh, they literally cut all these things out. Um, uh, we don't know, we don't really realize that now. We think, oh well, there's not, not much cypress along. The, but back in the day, before the salt water came all the way up the Calcasieu, you had cypress trees growing in Lake Charles. You had cypress oh, trees really? growing in Moss Lake. Oh yeah, realize. oh yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, the early uh, images show this, uh, and and. We're we're talking about cypress trees that are three, four, five, six hundred years old that were cut and processed, uh, and it, it was it processed until literally they were all cut out. Wow! You know, and um, uh. Uh, the uh, the the uh, there were many many families that connect with that the, the Manigans and the uh, uh, the Powells. I mean, you're, you're talking about most of the families made their big money with timber, and it's a uh, it's a. Uh, 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 you know, if you had the connection with timber and the cattle industry, you were covered. I mean, that's what this area was known for. And uh, it, it became um, uh, the reason for the development, the rapid development here. But it also meant that the steam uh, uh, equipment could uh, dig canals. The steam equipment could alter the surface of the land it could um it it could make cuts in the uh, t- uh in the big oxbows of the Calcasieu river at the time they it, it made cuts so you have like uh, Clooney island which is a uh, you know right off the port of lake charles if you look at the map of of this area you can see that the Calcasieu river made all sorts of loops in the essentially uh, man has cut through all of those cuts and brought the gulf up to lake charles uh, you know lake charles and sulfur frankly because yeah. you know the industry here is dependent upon transportation down the 
the uh, the Calcasieu River, but the Calcasieu River was not always what it is today. It was once a, a sluggish, essentially a bayou with a lot of curves and twists. And uh, the very earliest settlers here used sailing vessels, which took forever to get to the Gulf. And then when, when they got to Cameron, they had to be literally dragged over a sandbar at the mouth of the Calcasieu River. And uh, since that time, uh, you know, we've gone through the the developments of the port of Lake Charles and other entities to connect us by with first along the intercoastal, but afterwards all along the Calcasieu River by cutting through all of those loops, which brought the Gulf up and enlarged the 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 waterway from what it had been to something that that carries major vessels. Now, I mean, it's an ocean going. Port, but it wasn't always an ocean going port it's interesting you use the word and it just has been ringing in my ears as i in my mind as i've been listening to you and you said the word exploitation yeah well yeah yeah i mean that's a to know that, that that's what it was like here and then now well, some but it was, it, was, it was like that here but it was like that everywhere it's, yeah yeah right, it, you know, it's right. Not, it was man's domination of this of this environment yeah and it, it, uh, man and women i'm not i'm not no, no, I see. I know what yeah, you mean. Uh, yeah man and women's uh, 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 domination of this and this environment is so very fragile because again you go back to the go back to the geography uh we're on a pleistocene terrace there are various terraces that that it's all sedimentary land there's no bedrock here there's no rock in sulfur there's no rock in lake charles it's sedimentary so you have and you have these winding bayous and it's marsh and, and prairie that's what we have yeah um that land is very, very susceptible, and we're very low. We're very low. I mean, we're not we're not uh, 25 feet above sea level in, uh, here in Sulphur, nor are we in Lake Charles. And you're talking about um, uh, uh, land that is very, very susceptible to the environment that we're in. We live in a storm-based environment. The Gulf is not 35 miles due south of us. Uh, we're affected by that very, 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 very much. And uh, when you when you make access to the water, water will have access to you. It's a it's a that's a no brainer. Uh -huh. Which means that as we modify the Calcasieu River, uh, we have to remember that every modification, every cut has a, a a direct influence on on what happens. Salt water has come up. The river and we know that salt water was not traditionally up the river in uh, we're talking about about the uh, early 1800s because we see the trees growing in moss lake we see the trees growing in prion lake we see the trees growing in lake charles we see trees growing even in big lake so uh, these what used to be freshwater lagoons are now essentially saltwater lagoons because the the, the, the the salt water has come all the way up and we have to actually have a device to keep the salt water from going all the way to kinder really. yeah right, right 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 so it used to not be that way i mean right. naturally it used, to not, it wasn't it used to not be that way because the river once curved uh according to uh, uh some of the uh, engineering done for the uh for the port uh, the distance by water from uh, the city docks of Lake Charles to the Gulf, to the open Gulf, went from like 78 or 79 miles to 33. Wow. By cutting all the cuts. And you can see all the cuts. Uh, at Devil's Elbow, the water would, I mean, all the old water would make all these twists and turns. And all these islands, Coon Island, Colony Island, uh, and so forth, all the way down there are all cut. And that brings the, the water up. And I'm happy. You're driving down the road, everything is going just fine. You're listening to the new episode of Find the Good News in Your Car, and you're all stoked about trying out this zipper merge thing you've been hearing about when all of a sudden you hear that sickening tap on your windshield that's just a little too loud. I've got some bad news for you. You've just got yourself a rock chip. Unfortunately, I've got some worse news. If you don't take care of that rock chip, it's going to turn into a crack. But I do have some good news too. You don't have to have a rock chip or a crack because I've got a way for you to take care of it ASAP. If you go to asapglassco.com right now, you can stop that chip from winding across your windshield like the Calcasieu River. I used to be terrible about getting a rock chip, saying I'll take care of that later, and then later turns into this irritating crack that just spreads from one side of my windshield to the other. 
I should have taken care of it ASAP by scheduling a repair with ASAP Glass. ASAP Glass is local, right here in Sulphur, Louisiana, and they're mobile. Even better, you can get a quote right from your mobile phone at asapglassco.com. ASAP Glass is owned and operated by two of my best friends, lifelong friends, Dan and Kayla Smith. Dan the Glass Man will make sure his team of glass technicians gets to your job ASAP and make sure it's done right so you can keep that windshield crack out of sight. If you do get that rock chip and you don't take care of it ASAP, that's okay. ASAP Glass does complete windshield replacements. Remember, ASAP Glass is mobile, so you don't have to worry about finding time to drop your vehicle off at their shop. You get your quote at ASAPGlassCo.com. Make your appointment with Kayla, and then before long, an ASAP Glass van is on its way to your location. That's it. I know you're probably looking at a rock chip right now. Don't wait. Take care of it ASAP. Go to ASAPGlassCo.com on your mobile device and get a quote. That's ASAPGlassCo.com. And make sure to tell Dan and Kayla you heard about ASAP Glass on Find the Good News. And uh, that, that does affect a lot of other things because, again, it's very fragile land we're on. There's no rock. Very, very fragile. You know, I definitely never really think about that. You know, you walk outside and you just think you're standing on solid ground. But I mean, you yeah, know, yeah. in the in the, ge- ge- yeah, the and, geology of the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it really think about it. It's rolling Pleistocene mud is what you're on mostly when you <laughs> walk out. There. And that's why, I mean, you, uh, we drive around and you can tell, you know, the streets buckle all the time. And they, they buckle because they're not built on, on firm foundations. We're, we're, we're not like in Colorado where you can go and actually be on granite or schist or anything like that. We're on mud and uh there are ways to engineer around that certainly because i mean you can't have skyscrapers in new orleans if you didn't have means of dealing with pleistocene right. mud but um, um uh, towns like like houston new orleans beaumont like charles lafayette it's all essentially built on this sort of undulating subsurface that doesn't really have any firm foundation for any major construction and and you know that's why it, it's developed the way it's developed well sure i mean i was even telling some than just small i tell them my children uh when they were in lake charles and we were on the seawall and i said well where we were standing this wasn't here you know that's right. they're like what yeah <laughs> within yeah island. within <laughs> within the, li- the lifetime we've changed you can uh, that's a very good example those those 90 acres it was, it was all landfill at one time the, the the shoreline of lake charles was a working shoreline sort of like the, the shoreline on, on west lake side you know where you have the the uh the um, sand pits and the, all yeah. this sort of thing, you know, the, the, the gravel yards and so forth. You have that sort of thing on the other side. You had warehouses, you had railroad sidings and so forth. And all that's been been adjusted. Uh, so much of the uh, of, of, of Southwest Louisiana history is so plastic because we don't have that, that uh, we don't have a real sense of what it was like. It's sort of like the sulfur. Yeah, yeah. Sulfur is a beautiful example. Sulfur is a prime example of, of something that is, it was earth shattering world earth-shattering news when frash created the frash method right here in sulfur mm-hmm. and uh, the brimstone facility was creating millions and millions of dollars for the the company and the 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 italian monopoly on sulfur had been broken we now could get sulfur in in sulfur louisiana i mean how wonderful it was and you you would see the the mines out there and you'd see the sulfur being pumped out and in, in these 100 by 400 foot yeah uh, those photos that tall. tom has yeah, over there really. just blow my mind it's I never... amazing i mean the, the, it's an absolutely phenomenal thing and yet all of that is erased yeah you don't see any of that i mean you can't even get to the where the sulfur mines were uh, and and because of that, we lose that that sense of where we have been because so much of sulfur's history, so much of Southwest Louisiana's history, has been essentially erased. Not necessarily willfully erased, but the fact that we're, we we live in an area with uh, you know with hurricanes and uh, eighty inches of rain and uh, you know all sorts of mold and mildew and three kinds of termites and everything else is out there designed to get rid of what heritage we have in, yeah. in, in in real form that it's it's difficult because we have to continuously tell the stories because if you didn't know you wouldn't know 
You know, yeah. if you didn't know, you wouldn't know about the lumber. If you didn't know, you wouldn't know about the sulfur. If you didn't know, you wouldn't know about the cattle. Uh, you know, and they're, they're hints. They're hints. You know, it's the McNeese Cowboys. And now we know why. And, you know, uh, we have Fitz and Ryder Road in Prater Street. We know why. You know, we know why there's brimstone in, in, in right. brimstone. You know, it, it's, it, it, but those little, those little hints can easily be forgotten unless you have, uh, uh, you know, a good sense of local history. And you do. Well, I do, but the thing is, it's not it's not particularly common. Yeah, uh, you know, no, there, it isn't. most people don't know their history, and uh, it's particularly difficult here because so many people who are even native born to 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 Louis to Southwest Louisiana don't know the history. But we have a lot of young people and people from other areas that come in because the opportunity here in Southwest Louisiana has always been ripe. You came to Southwest Louisiana to work. And people have done that for 250 years. Still doing it. Still doing it. And it, it, there's opportunity here. But you come here, you work, and then you might go somewhere else to retire. And the thing is, people who are passing through the economy don't necessarily have a stake in the economy, don't necessarily need to know the past. They just need to know that their paychecks are not going to bounce. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So the people who are native-born people and the people who choose to live here really need to know something about the the absolutely fascinating history and the rich history and the different from the rest of Louisiana, different from the rest of the South, different from the rest of the nation history that we have here because it's it we have history from so many different directions, pulling in so many different directions and coming in from so many different influences that it's uh, particularly special. Well, you know, I mean, that's something I think about quite often. I said, you know, there's, there's generations of children that are growing up in the world without a sense of place because they don't know where they've came from that that history of their maybe their just their particular family hasn't been shared with them mm -hmm. and uh they don't know who they are they don't know where they come from they don't have any culture that they can cling to then they, they may not have a faith that they can cling to they just don't even know where they come from and so then they're and then they move around 10, 12 times. You know, don't don't set down roots. I honestly think it does something to your psyche. Yeah, well, it does because if you're just a windblown seed, it's hard to 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 make connections if you're just a windblown seed. Yeah, uh, and it's it's you know some granted sometimes you have to be that way, and sometimes you have to be that way because of economy, but uh, the economics. But the the fact of the matter is, in terms of of the building of community and the building of place, you have to have something. To, to 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 root it in, yeah, and you know the 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 this area is um, uh, an exceptional area, and it's a, it it doesn't drag the uh, the old south with it particularly. Um, it it, oh, it, yeah, it okay. you know really it doesn't drag the old south because we we you know, yes we were part of the south and yes there were people who owned slaves in southwest Louisiana and that's you know that's proven but um, the uh, uh, there's a certain, um, I don't know, humor or willingness to work uh, 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 under different circumstances here. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that that. Uh, this was the area where you you might have had slaves, but you worked alongside your slave. You didn't, no, I you didn't necessarily send them out six hundred pick and cot because we just didn't have that kind of economy here. We just did not have the the sort of economy that uh, the people along the Mississippi River or the Red River faced in terms of the way they 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 are built. Yeah, uh, you know they're built slightly differently here. You had new beginnings, new starts, and that we that's a good thing to. Yeah, and it sounds like from listening to what you're saying is really we're kind of in a unique situation to have a really a multicultural economy. It, right? it is. I mean, it, it is a multicultural economy, and it, it's pretty diverse. And it's not it's not so overwhelmingly based on one particular thing. Um, uh, it's not here. The price of oil is not going to kill us. It can go up or down. It doesn't really. It's not really going to. I mean, it affects everybody in the South, frankly, everybody in the United States. But it's not as as so it's not as dependent as it would be in lafayette for example mm, in lafayette okay. the price of oil is un, uh, i mean it's first and foremost the reason for lafayette to exist uh, uh here uh, yes we have that as a but we also have these other things that are in place and it's a little bit more diverse when it happens that way it, 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 not to say that we don't have boom and bust we certainly do have boom and bust but it's not nearly as um as uh one industry dependent as some places. Yeah. Uh, a part of it is that we're not, uh, 
I mean, we don't have very much population here. I mean, we only have, I mean, the, the entire parish of Kelchi has maybe 200,000 people, you know, and that's not a huge amount considering that it's almost 800 square miles. Uh, that's not, that's not uh, you know, a lot of people on the ground. Uh, and uh, there's still some opportunity, there's some flexibility and opportunity here that may not necessarily be available everywhere in the state or everywhere in the country. Uh, we have opportunity here because uh, essentially we're still growing yeah you know, we're still deciding who we're going to be and where we're going to be it's very interesting what what kind of touchstones do people have here that they can like really see today where they can go oh that's history right there i mean you know i know there was the, the fire of 1910 like you said it's kind of a great eraser you know and knocks and, and wipes a lot of things out well but. the thing here the thing uh, as far as touchstones the for me architecture is the way you have to look at at, at you know what our, the Piner families did and, and to get some understanding of, of what's here. But for example, if you take the Brimstone facility, which is fabulous, I, we love the Brimstone facility, but you have to remember it's been moved three times from right. where it originally <laughs> was. Right. So you have to remember the context of, of what we have. We have all of our history, to me, is so precious because there's so little of it left. Ah. And efforts to retain it and to preserve it, even if you have to move it, is better than just tearing it down. And um, uh, the uh, uh, we do have a preservation society in Calcutta Parish that actually is for the entire parish, and we we want to mark places that are important to history because we've lost so many of them. Okay. And uh, uh, the thing is, history for me is is something that that is an economic, social, religious motivator for the community. So old churches are wonderful. Yeah. Support your old churches. It's great because somebody had faith, you know, in 1911, 1912, 1913, and they built the cathedral. And the cathedral is, says, we're going to be here. We want to be here. This is where we are. This is what we are. So you, you take that and use that as an example. Uh, you look at Temple Sinai. Temple Sinai, there, were, there was a Jewish mm -hmm. community in southwest Louisiana from the very beginning. Uh, important uh, leaders of the community. Here we are. This is what we are. Here we are. It, we made our statement. You know, um, and it, you know, in sulfur, uh, if you look at the the adaptive reuse of the judicial center, which was once a Catholic church, yeah, hooray, yeah, because it's better than tearing the thing down. Because the people who are who are, I think it was Prompt Secretary, Prompt Secretary, yeah, yeah, that's right. If you take Prompt Secretary, well, they have their own history. They're in a new facility, but their history, you can say, before here we were here, and now that building, we we it was important enough. It was uh, it, that it's adaptively reused for something else, and we can tell it tells a story. It tells a story of use when it was built. It tells a story of use after it was outgrown by its congregation. The point is that old buildings are not just old buildings. They have to have a if they have a purpose and if they have a life afterwards, you begin to, you can connect, instead of tearing them down, which tears down all the memories and tears everything, loses everything, adaptive will use them for something else. And that change says that you can have a life as well. Yeah. Buildings have a life too. And um, um, again, it's difficult because we're in a climate that is, um, uh, it's not conducive to building maintenance. Buildings are difficult to maintain because they're physical structures in an environment in a climate that is really difficult. Foundation is not good. The, you know, think rain. You know, drain. I mean, every excuse you can come up with is there. But if you build right, you, a building can outlive its original use and many other uses. Yeah. And that's part of our problem. I don't like disposable architecture. No, I, I agree. You know, I had, and and there may be a lot of people but that have done this, but uh, for me, it was a nice treat. I had to go film an event last November, and they wanted to have some time-lapse photography. And the best location was to go up inside the clock at 1911. Mm -hmm. I'd never been up there. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, wow. I mean, I was like, you know just to not hurry up and just get up there and do the job i wanted to take my time because you know just walking up those old stairs and touching the wood and just to think you know it's sort of like a little time yeah. capsule yeah in here. the buildings have you can hear old buildings you can <laughs> yeah. smell old buildings and i'm not saying it's just from the must of the mold the the deal is buildings have a life themselves and 
In terms of telling a story, it's the best prop you have to tell a story. I guarantee you, it would be a lot easier to tell the story of the lumber industry in southwest Louisiana if we had a sawmill that was still in place. Yeah. It would be a whole lot easier to tell the story of the sulfur industry in, in southwest Louisiana if we still had one of those gigantic bins where the sulfur, the wet sure. sulfur was allowed to settle. And you could say, look at this thing. Isn't this impressive? And you know they had to blow this up and, and it, it was put into, into, into railroad cars and cart it out this way it you know those stories are so much easier to tell because you have the prop in front of you yeah and when you have the prop it's so much easier for people to understand the, the what ha, what it was like a hundred years ago yeah because you have the prop here we have so few props left um when i do tours of the of lake charles one of the things that that uh, is a big surprise for a lot of people is that we had a streetcar system in lake charles and it, it was there for about 35 years and the streetcar system would have been would have completely changed the way the city grew it had it been allowed to continue yeah you know and it uh, there it was uh, there are only five cities in louisiana that had streetcar systems new orleans is the only one that does now and of course new orleans streetcars that's a big tourist thing in new orleans yeah. i mean my god they love the st charles streetcar and the others but we had streetcars in lake charles and uh it, interestingly enough and this is one of the things that uh, the city of lake charles doesn't like me to say this but i'm gonna say it uh, <laughs> we're in we the had, wild west you yeah we're in the wild west <laughs> uh the, when we had the streetcar system in lake charles the 35 years we had it for a time the streetcar ran 24 hours a day and seven days a week really yeah and the reason for that was that the big industry was the sawmills and the sawmills ran 24 hours a day uh -huh. seven days a week because once you got the saws going and steam powered you just ran that that lumber in constantly yeah they okay. were processing 60 million square uh, 60 million board feet of lumber uh at a time in, in like Charles, I mean that was a month's production, sixty million square. Uh, I mean sixty million board feet of it. That's a lot of board feet, and so the the, the sawmills would go twenty four hours a day, and so the streetcars went seven. It was a twenty four hour day, it's twenty four hour work day, twenty four hour economy, twenty four hour public transportation. Ah. Gotcha. See? Wow, that's interesting because even now, now when we say that, people go, "Oh, we live in a twenty-four hour world." Yeah, we say we it don't. like it's. We say it like that's new, though. But there was time. It's when not. <laughs> it's not. And the thing is, uh, there, there's a certain practicality in accepting that you have a twenty-four hour uh, work day, and, and we do. And I mean, Southwest Louisiana, uh, particularly nowadays, when you have the plants and you have the casinos, which are both twenty-four hour operations. Right. Frankly, uh, why don't we have twenty-four hour, you know, uh, transportation? And it's sort of like, oh, well, people have to get to work. Kids have to get to school. People have to yeah. get to church. Why not have 24-hour uh, operations? It, it, it's bizarre. But in any case, uh, you know, the, the things change. Things remain the same. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that I would hear you say anything in the past that was about a 24-hour yeah. uh world but we we would talk about that like that's new i know it's kinda not, got new. Me scratching no, no, my head. not new at all in, in, in fact i mean there was a longer working period i mean the the hour the idea of an eight hour work day was not something that uh a hundred years ago they would have even accepted i mean that's a that's a fairly modern concept back then you might have worked 10 or 12 hours a, a day and lordy if you had to do that then you needed transportation to get around. I mean, unless you had your own horse or bicycle and heaven forbid car because you couldn't afford a car. Yeah. So Lost Lake Charles, I mean, when you write this, is this, this is sort of like your, uh, I guess, passion project. Yeah. I mean, you get it, to it share was, some it, of these. It, it was my passion project. It was, it, it's so difficult to tell the story of this area. And I'm talking not just Lake Charles, all of Southwest Louisiana. It's so difficult to tell the story because so much of the history, so much of the actual props are erased yeah and when the props are erased you have to start thinking well why are they erased well in some cases like the great fire that, that's that's true i mean progress yeah you have to think of that too progress happens uh the unique geography of of the way we are here uh rail lines for example are travel in a very narrow corridor uh -huh. uh, at one time Kansas city southern and southern pacific had to run lines i mean not 300 yards apart because there was only one place across the river. I see. You know, and uh, it, again, get moving around. Southwest Louisiana has always been difficult, and it's it, you know we think of it. Oh, it's a it's a 
a 2019 problem. No, it's not. It's always been, there's always been a difficulty because the unique geography of Southwest Louisiana is such that, that there are, there are ridges where the roadways are. And if you don't, then you're going to better get some very tall hiking boots because you're going to be in the muck yeah, pretty yeah. soon. Well, that makes a lot of sense. My grandmother, uh, she's 90 something years old. And she was talking about when my aunt was born, how you had to get across the Calcasieu. And I was just blown away. I said, because we just don't think about that now. There was no bridge. I mean, complicated uh travel was isn't a new thing yeah complicated travel is not difficult it's not new at all and uh uh you know the very first um the very first uh settlers here had to cross with with pirogues and dugouts and then rope ferries you know and and uh, uh which again we have a little bit of a history of that when you think of goss ferry road and anthony ferry road and perkins ah, ferry the road names are in the road the names are in the road uh, at the end of each of those roads there was a rope ferry that was operated by the perkins family or the goss family or whatever and that's how you got across the the, the calcasieu getting across getting from lake charles to sulfur has not ever ever been easy um when uh, when we had a, a you know a lot of lumber um the uh like charles was used as a holding pond for cut lumber uh trees were cut branded as to which mill they belonged to and then they were fished out of the water really okay and so you could for a time you could actually walk from like charles to west like if you were very agile you could walk on the logs i guess to cross the calcash that's wild <laughs> uh, but um uh, it's it, it's always been a challenge and of course the old timers remember i mean really old timers remember that we used to have ferries that crossed the calcasieu there was the uh uh the the hazel was one ferry and the, the borealis rex was another ferry that that transported people down to cameron you know which was the only way you could get to cameron frankly before they even had gravel roads to get to cameron so it, it's been a it's a it's a uh it's always been a, a kind of an interesting an interesting um I don't know, uh, unusual way of getting from here to there. Yeah. Well, I've been passed a note to ask you about the Preservation Society's Lost Landmarks Project. Oh, my heavens, yes. Well, Lost Landmarks is one of the things that tries to, to address some of the the uh, erasures that we've had. And um, uh, one of the things that, that might be very useful, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the program, then I'm going to ask for help from people who are listening to yeah. this, this podcast. Um uh, the Lost Landmarks is uh, really a continuation of a Southwest Historical Association's project to mark the sites of lost building structures, whatnot, that were important to the history of Southwest Louisiana. Uh, we've marked places like the Majestic Hotel okay. and uh, Gold Band Records and Balls Auditorium and uh, the Louisiana Baptist Orphanage and a lot of sites. There are about 15 sites that are marked. And every year we, we are challenged to find three more landmarks to mark. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we are working right now on the, uh, the list for 2019-2020. Uh, it's an expensive process. We, the, the Preservation Society has to generate money in order to put these signs, which tell a thumbnail history on the actual site where the structure was. Tells the thumbnail history, directs you to the website of the Preservation Society. It gives you more information and links to other resources. So if you want to know more about Balls Auditorium, you can go to the website. You can, you can read about Balls Auditorium, or you can learn learn about the what happened to the Louisiana Baptists when the orphanage shut down in 1926 so our St. Charles Academy or, or any of the number of other places well uh, we are looking for for new sites and and uh, we're we're trying to uh, we're trying to encourage people to provide us links and leads to new I sites. See. Okay. So uh, we've already had a couple of interesting leads there are folks that are interested in, in marking uh, the site of uh, the Chateau Charles. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the Chateau Charles, a fascinating building, mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful example of uh, what it was like mid century. It was a motor, hot, motor hotel is yeah. what they call it well, it was them, so. kind of the only one of the only things like that around here. It, it was it was and it was very it was very prestigious in its day that's uh, elvis stayed there now it's just a parking lot unfortunately yeah, yeah its water system was contaminated and they it had to shut down because it's the water system was my mother was a, um a maid there oh. whenever i was a oh. young 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 boy oh well i mean you know, we used to eat there i mean it was a fabulous place to eat and we're thinking that the the but we need that story so the the, the uh we have a shout out to the tullis family to give us the tullis 
family history, and uh, we want images of that. We, and it, we're, seriously, it's one of the buildings that needs yeah. to be looked at. But we are looking for other candidate properties too. And uh, you can't just say, "Oh, well, I think Barden's needs to be marked, or or Joseph's Pizza needs to be marked, or the New Moon Theater needs to be marked." We would like some some candidate properties from West Cal too. Yeah, because it, West Cal history is it, just like like Charles history. West Cal history is needs to be shared. It needs to be out there. So this is a particular um, effort uh, for listeners. If you do have candidate properties of of structures that were important to the history of Southwest Louisiana, to contact the Preservation Society uh, either at their Facebook page or their website, uh, calcutiapreservation.org, or on Facebook, it's Calcutia Preservation Society. And, it's her preservation. And just message us. Let us know. Give us the history of the site. Uh, if you have information about, for example, the uh, the uh, uh, the Chateau Charles, then uh, tell us some of that history. As I say, we do have a shout out to the uh, to the Tullis family who were the last owners to give us some of the history because the uh, guest list was spectacular yeah that's what i've heard yeah and it would be wonderful to 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 be able to share that history because there's absolutely nothing left of it and that's one of the one, one of the sad things is that we we do have buildings that have been determined to be disposable and they're they're gone and once they're gone those memories are gone too unless you have something that tells that story it's interesting how that works i mean you know and i I couldn't tell you the particulars of it but i think it's uh the residue of memories i guess that you don't really have landmarks to or you do have where landmarks are important so when i was a kid i had to have uh ear surgeries in shreveport louisiana but i was very young Mm -hmm. and um you know, when I got older and I would go to Shreveport, I'd always take the interstate mm-hmm. and just blow right up there and get come back. But then I had to get off one time and I ended up taking some backcountry roads. And I mean, even as an adult, I would go, this looks familiar. This building looks familiar. This mm-hmm. looks familiar. You go through these little towns and this gas station is old. A lot of these things are shut down. They're gone. But there's something special about being able to actually see that it's and touch the, it. It's know? the prop that you need to have to tell the story. It's a memory aid. Yeah. And it, 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 if you can have the memory aid serving a contemporary purpose, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, for example, Calcium Marine Bank, Calcium Marine National Bank has, I mean, for people who are uh, bankers might remember it. People who are who are uh, interested in the the Burton or the Lawton families, you have a connection there. Uh, but if you had somebody who got married there, you I mean, it has a life beyond its original purpose, and that's part of it. The stories it has to tell can be told whether it's a bank an event center or something else as long as it's still there yeah once it goes once it becomes a vacant field it no longer has the power to tell stories it no longer has that power and that's something that we should never erase our history you know uh sometimes the the history it needs to be there the structure the site the 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 thing needs to be there just so that we it, it marks a spot in time when this was the way it was whether right or wrong this was the way it was yeah and it, it needs to tell that story elsewise we have nothing to base our ex- culture on yeah you know some places for me and it's interesting the timing we're having this conversation places for me that i can do that are cemeteries yeah they, they tend to not change from the inside right so if you if you go to an old cemetery that you've frequented and maybe you have memories there or, or maybe loved ones there or it's a place uh that you just like to get away to, which I do because they're very peaceful. I, f- I like to go there because it doesn't change. I can go to the interior, or the oldest parts, mm-hmm. and it feel like uh, it's captured, it's mm-hmm. protected. You know? Yeah. yeah. If you go to Antioch Bigwood Cemetery, uh, if you go to the central yeah. part of that, it's pretty much the way it was 70 years ago or today. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be maintained. I mean, every cemetery, again, has to deal with the issues that we deal with here because we are in a particularly... Uh, uh, bad climate e- ecologically speaking for structures uh, and so we have to be really really sensitive to these things uh, you live on the coast you have coastal issues that have to be tended to but you're right cemeteries are are a great example of w- telling those stories and whether it's it's Antioch Bigwoods or uh, Henning or uh, uh, Bilbo Cemetery yeah. or you know Salier or any of those there are stories that are told that can only be told because the, the memorials are there that, that can make those connections. It's very interesting I was out at um, 
It's not uh, Consolata, but whatever's right next to Consolata. Yeah, Prion Pines. Prion Pines. And I stopped there one day between meetings to go take a walk. And then um, I hadn't been out there in months, and I walked by Elton Louvier's grave. And then as I kept walking, I walked by uh, Beverly Pittman, the owner of KD's uh, stone. And I said, you know, this right here, just that sector... <laughs> captures a moment a, a particular section of time here's some people who had businesses here's an artist that made an impact all just in this row and you know cemeteries are clustered that way a lot of times you know you'll have this little bit of time where a, a particular set of experiences happened or history happened uh, exactly uh, it, in in like charles interestingly enough um, there are two cemeteries that i have a particular affinity for because there are huge monuments there that some folks may not know about um, after the audrey hurricane um, the there were bodies that were found for months and months and months afterwards and there were unidentified remains too and there are two cemeteries uh, that happen to have the uh, the remains of the unknown oh. from Audrey um, uh, Highland Memorial Gardens on Gulf Highway is one and Combray uh, Cemetery up on Opelousa Street is the other really and there are large patches that are are dedicated to the, the the bodies that were found and unidentified and unclaimed. So it's like a mass. Uh, grave they're they're mass graves for the two, and um, uh, it's there's there's a, a, a sadness there because forever, the residents of Cameron Parish and the residents of of, of Calcutta Parish are connected by that tragedy. Sure. And the unknown being buried in those two mass graves uh is uh, uh it, to me it's it's a chilling sort of thing yeah, because yeah. it's just within my memory it's just within my memory audrey i was um, about four or five years old for audrey okay you must and, be the same age as my mother uh, oh my god i hate to think that <laughs> that's probably true but I do re recall my, my father had been working, He like a lot of people in St. Martin Parish, he was in St. Martin Parish, had worked in, in Calcutta. He came here to, to, to work, and he worked here for a while, and he knew some folks from Cameron, and after the, the horrible storm, uh, probably uh, maybe October of 57, he took the back roads, and uh, we went to Cameron, and uh, one of the very first memories I have, and this is as a wee wee child, is the smell. Oh wow! Because that we happened to come on a day when they were burning uh, trees and and cattle and whatnot that had been drowned up, and were you know it was a, a, a hygiene issue. Uh, this, even at that point, they were burning all of this stuff, and it was the smell of Cameron uh, after the, the storm. I still have that in my memory. Oh, and what a great history re-stimulator right yeah, there. Yeah, smell. really. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a spectacular. And, and so there's, there's, a, there's a connection there because the people who have first-hand experience of Audrey are now on their way out. And so the, that second stand, they're going to have a different experience of Audrey. I, I remember the smell of Audrey mm. as well as the, the sight of seeing the trees blown down and the houses ripped up and all this sort of thing. Uh, but, but those memories are going to be passing on you know, when I go, and I don't know that, that young folks know that, that, no, that sensation. No, no, I mean, so that's, that's... it's kind of cool. It's, it's cool and interesting. It's, it's part of the, uh, it's part of the, uh, of the, uh, the the process, so we have to uh, we have to be very encouraging of efforts that that remind us of our history. And uh, uh, I, I just want to do a shout out to the the folks over at the Brimstone because yeah. they, they're doing some root, some very creative things to to give us some of that history back because some of it has changed and, and uh, the the caretaker uh, properties that they're reworking on and reconstructing to try to give an idea of what it was like to be in west cal is a vital part of of what needs to happen in communities like sulfur because we need to know our past i have to say tom listens to this show oh good tom he does he's been on the show he listens to this show and you know i told him i said every single time somebody brings up the brimstone somebody mentions their efforts over there oh yeah and I, that's good i'm glad to hear yeah, it's that good kind of stuff. well it's it's a wise use of resources to to uh, the the henning building too uh, and the fact that brimstone i mean it, it the, the fact that it's been moved twice is to me amazing because it would have been so easy to make other decisions, you know, and and it shows that there's a certain resolve in keeping the uh, 
in, in keeping this thing going because it, it it is so difficult, particularly difficult here because so much of the population of sulfur is not a native to, to this area. They come in to work and, you know, they pass through and hopefully their time here is a wonderful time with great memories. But um, it, it, we have to we have to keep that that urgency and try to keep those reminders of the past here as much as possible. Well, on that note, I mean, is and I'm just curious, and there may be many, but is there one thing that sticks out to you that we are in really severe danger of losing, and whether a landmark of some sort or um, a place that's maybe just not identified that really needs to be? You know, it's hard to pinpoint one particular spot. <clears throat> to me, the thing that is most frightening is that uh, our general area, and we're ta- I'm talking about all southwest Louisiana, is so fragile that uh, the next big storm, mm. we can see whole things washed out. Uh, I- I'm, I'm reminded of the, the major, major changes since uh, Harvey and Rita in Cameron. Yeah, where you know before that, and and Audrey even before that, uh, uh, there are entire cultures along the coast that have been erased totally. Yeah, you know Cameron as a community, uh, as a, 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 a town built around that that courthouse, has gone through three or four lives, and mm. it's been completely washed away. And pretty much now it's difficult. You have to live somewhere else and come to Cameron. Yeah, and. Uh, the the thing is the same thing that could happen with cameron and holly beach could happen just as easily with greg graywood or with carlos yeah because you the the next line of defense is right. is right there it, it's where the whole area is very very fragile uh, a, a super storm, a super hurricane could very easily knock out anything that's below let's say 25 feet above sea level very easily you know and uh, that's what i'm concerned with i mean we talk about buildings and buildings are very important but but the entire substrate of this area can be so easily manipulated by weather yeah that uh uh, that's what i'm concerned with We, we need to be very very cautious about about that and all the other things that lead to that yeah um uh, it, it's uh, well over development's not a, not going to help either i mean does. um too too much too fast you know i mean we have warnings from other communities oh yeah like we that, do you know? we do and and that's why it's it's um it, it, it's uh i mean we see it but how well is that lesson learned <laughs> right you know? well profits profits drive many things and sometimes <laughs> it's not always good uh, sense well yeah the, the the odd <laughs> thing is though that we have to remember that the, the profits that remain home are the ones that that, that are used to repair where their problems, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's good that that uh, carpet our corporate uh, residents are uh, aware that that they have an investment that has to be protected too, and, and maybe that's the way to approach it. Yeah, I got gotcha. um, right. you. I'm reminded about um, the, the perhaps the most resilient symbol of Southwest Louisiana, to my mind. Uh, it's something that you may not know about, but I'm a real keen supporter of is the Sabine Lighthouse. You know, I've never been to the Sabine you Lighthouse. You need to go to the Sabine Lighthouse. Uh, it's um, it's um, It was authorized by Martin Van Buren. Really? Uh, 1856. I've only seen pictures. Never. Well, uh, let me tell you, the, the Sabine Lighthouse, which uh, there is a, a, an active proposal now to, to, to stabilize it and do has withstood hurricane after hurricane after hurricane it's right at the very tip edge of louisiana uh it's um it's uh, uh one of the few lighthouses you can actually go and look at just drive down 82 and you can take a little side road and take your glasses and look at it it's it's fabulous and it to me is the real symbol of southwest louisiana because this brick structure out in the middle of absolutely nowhere it's it's at the corner of the 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 the, uh, the state has withstood world war one world war two the korean war it's withstood uh, uh the spanish-american war it's probably the oldest masonry structure uh, west of the uh, uh of the tesh valley and and south of alexandria it's that important to the area uh, it's absolutely vital to texas uh, uh navigation because it was the the guiding light into the sabine river into the 
the trade in, uh, in the in Beaumont and Port Arthur and all that. That that was their their lighthouse. Uh, of course, Calcutta Lighthouse is gone. We used to have one as well, but this one is still in place, and it's Louisiana's lighthouse, and it's a it's a fabulous symbol of how to build. Even back then in the eighteen. Uh, 50s, they knew how to build with the wings to, uh-huh. to, to push the weight out over the wide area. And, so fascinating. Uh, yeah. Listening to you describe that, I mean, and, and I, could, I could honestly, and you might, you may not agree, but I could compare the way you keep this history to that lighthouse. Ah, well, there you are. I really can. I mean, because yeah. it, it's resilient. Oh, it has to be done. Um, it's very important to have good foundation. It's very good to know you know, where you've come from and how to move forward into the future. Yeah. Whoever built that lighthouse obviously was thinking about all of that. Hopefully. Hopefully it was. It, it, anyway, there, there's work out there now to, to help support it. The, so it's a shout out to uh, Andy Tinkler and the folks at the Cal- at the uh, Cameron Preservation Alliance, which is doing all they can to, to keep that building up and moving. Uh, in fact, they even have licenses now that you can get license plates now as a little plug to them. Really? Yeah. You can get a, a Sabine Lighthouse plate. And uh, I would certainly encourage listeners to do that if you can. It supports the efforts of, of preservation of that particular. Oh, wow. Are there lots of plates like that? Uh, not very many. It's just started. Oh, I mean, wow. it, it, it just came on. That. Yeah, it just came online, I believe, in February. So early part of February. So, I mean, you can get a low number. You probably get, you know, a two digit number, but it would certainly support the efforts of the. Yeah, of the I life. actually would encourage people to do that. I, I actually would like to do that myself. I didn't yeah. know that. Well, yeah, if you're if you don't want to support McNeese or you don't want to support. Um, uh, so we have a problem in our family because I'm LSU. Melinda, my wife, is uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, went to Louisiana Tech. I see. So okay. it would have to be a, a LSU La Tech thing, and they don't have that plate. But so, yeah. so we, we've. We're uh, waiting for our license plate it, to come in from. Yeah, plate. we're waiting for our license plate <laughs> to come in. But um, yeah, if you don't, if you have, uh, if you're, if the husband is a McNeese and the wife went to uh, some other school, you cannot have unless you have more than one car. Get a Sabine Lighthouse plate because <laughs> then, then you, you're, you've sort of split the difference because it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a, an effort that needs to be supported because to me it really is the symbol of of the entire region it's not just cameron's lighthouse uh in fact at the time it was it was constructed it was in calcio parish oh really the imperial, yeah it was part of imperial calcio oh, okay. at that point um uh, cameron didn't get set up as its own parish until 1870 and this lighthouse began in 18 1856 i think they started work on it and the light it worked for, as a lighthouse for 90 years. Uh, now there's a directional uh, beacon further out, but uh, the, the point is there was a lighthouse keeper uh, station there. Uh, it uh, The uh, famous battle, the Texas Civil War battle of, uh, of um, Sabine Pass, you know, the two battles of Sabine Pass where Dick Dowling fought and all this stuff okay. takes place right there. Uh, Texas' most famous Civil War battle happens on Louisiana soil, so there you are. Uh, <laughs> that tells you how important it is, not yeah. only to Louisiana, but also to Southeast Texas. So it's a shout out to any of your listeners in Southeast Texas. Yeah, if you can, get a Louisiana, buy a car in Louisiana and get a license plate to Louisiana to help support the effort uh, because it is indeed the, the, the Western Louisiana, Southwest, uh, Southeast Texas. Texas's lighthouse. It it is the big lighthouse, and um, it's a remarkable piece of uh, of history that we still have, and it goes back to 1856, pre Civil War. That's incredible. It, you wouldn't think it. And I'm happy. I know it. This episode's Fishing for Goodies Fishbowl sponsor is Brimstone Museum and Henning Cultural Center in Sulphur, Louisiana. I don't know what you look for when you travel, but one of the things I look for when I'm putting together my itinerary is a unique museum or gallery in the city I'm traveling to. I do this almost every time I go to a new city, but if I'm being honest, I'm guilty of not always doing that very thing right here at home in Sulphur, Louisiana. That's really a shame because we have one of the most interesting, historically relevant, and culturally rich corners in any city in the country about two minutes from where I'm sitting right now. I'm talking about the Brimstone Museum and Henning Cultural Center. Have you ever really thought about why our city is named Sulphur? They've got a permanent exhibit on the history of the sulphur industry that answers that simple question and more. You really get a full scope of just how important the sulphur mining industry was to the development of Southwest Louisiana and the impact it had on the rest of the world. Yes, 
the rest of the world. On the same property, right next door to the museum, is the Henning Cultural Center, presenting some of the most interesting, modern, and culturally relevant local art shows I've ever seen. My dear friend Tom Trahan and the Brimstone Historical Society have really worked hard to give us this treasure, and it's a multifaceted jewel that I plan to take advantage of more often. You don't have to wonder what their hours are, or how to get there, or what shows are coming up. Just go to brimstonemuseum.org, like I did, and subscribe to their mailing list right there on the home page. That's brimstonemuseum.org. Tom will make sure you start getting the announcements for each and every new show at the gallery. But you don't have to wait for the mail to arrive to enjoy this historical local treasure. You don't have to be guilty, like me, of overlooking a local wonder that conveniently sits next to the Grove, one of the most beautiful walking parks in southwest Louisiana. Drop in and say hi to Tom for me. Tour the museum and center, and make sure to tell Tom that you heard about Brimstone Museum on Find the Good News. Now, let's take that dive in the fishbowl. I'll tell you, this has been a ton of fun. I could actually probably listen to this all day. There is a part of this show, if you've ever listened to it, called Fishing for Goodies. Yep. And this fishbowl is full of questions, uh. and you get to draw three three and then we'll discuss them now i don't know what they all are these are some of them from past guests and uh huh, this is interesting yeah and i don't know what you're gonna get and some of them are from uh writing deck there's all kinds of things in there oh really yeah now i've been surprised a few times okay three huh okay here we go this Here's should be one. fun okay which character from a movie or, or book would you most like to meet and why Oh my heavens. Let's That's see. probably a few, uh, huh? Probably a few. Describe what life would be like in three years if you don't allow your bad habits to stop you. Oh my god. <laughs> write a letter to someone who has impacted your life. You don't have to write a letter. We're the last uh, person who pulled that one, we okay. just discussed it. Okay, well, all right. Okay, well. Let's start with uh, describe what life would be like in three years if you don't allow your bad habits to stop you. Well, if I don't allow my bad habits to stop me, I'd probably, um, well, I, I, I'd probably need to lose weight. I'm old. I'm old and cranky, <laughs> and I need to take care of my health because, it's, you know, you have to look at the other end of, of existence as far as it goes. In fact, just before we began this, uh, my oldest cousin called me to say that her husband had passed away. and. Uh, you, when you get to a certain age, you begin to think of mortality sure. a little bit more, more poignantly. And um, you, when something like that happens, you say, well, I've got to correct my ways. And, you know, or that's just... Be a lost landmark. Uh, that's right. I'll be a lost landmark, that's too. That's right. That's so right. So there you are. Improve your ways, Adley Cormier. <laughs> uh, um, which character from a book or movie would you most like to meet and why? <sighs> wow. Gosh, I really have to think about that. Mm, write a letter to someone who has impact. Well, the letter that I'd like to write probably would be to my high school French teacher, believe it or not. Yeah, her name okay. was her name was Jean Castile. Uh, and she was a uh, um, her family was a, a Cajun family from Southwest Louisiana on on her mother's side. They were Thibodeaux's Castiles are actually uh, French directly from France as far as Southwest Louisiana goes. And uh, she really encouraged me to uh, to study. Uh, I, interestingly enough, as a as a kid, I was, lived in in Saint Martin Parish, and when I was a child in high school, uh, Saint Martin Parish had a, 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 a not particularly good reputation. It, it it had the lowest literacy. Its literacy was sixty sixth in the state and that was at a time when there was an independent school system in monroe it was the last school system in the state as far as literacy went and louisiana was the last state in the nation uh as far as literacy so we were the bottom of the bottom of the barrel and one of the things that that the school board did in st Mart parish back then this was in the late 60s early 70s they decided that they were going to improve the teaching quality and one of the teachers that they brought in was John Castile. Uh -huh. And John Castile uh, really encouraged all of her students, and particularly me, to, uh, to continue and to do well. And to, uh, uh, one of those teachers that fires you up to learn. Yeah. And she was one of those teachers that fired you up to learn. That's awesome. And uh, it's, uh, I would write a letter to her thanking her. 
for that that service and uh, uh so uh, uh jean she's gone now but uh she's been long gone and her entire family's gone but there's a little shout out to jean castile i find that very powerful that you brought that up you know i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna be blessed here in a few weeks to actually have the teacher that was the same thing in my life my speech teacher in high school really changed my life how wonderful and she's actually going to come on the show how fabulous and I'm, I'm hearing you say that makes me realize how blessed i am to be able to sit across sometimes you have those interactions with people that, that 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 give you a little bit of faith in yourself and a willingness to go on and make the best of yourself and they're not they're not um I don't think they're recognized. Sometimes I think everybody needs to have somebody that that says you can do it. Yeah, and you can make it happen. Yeah, and and uh, John Castle was the one for oh, me. Man, the value of that's infinite. Yeah, I mean, it really just, is. It really, really is. is. It changes your life. Uh, which character from a movie? But oh, well, I tell you, I would love to meet. Uh, and this is a this is a real character. And if you've, um, uh, I'd love to meet Abraham Lincoln. To tell oh, you the truth, really? Uh, yeah, Spielberg's uh, movie of Lincoln, uh, which was uh, with Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, Daniel yeah, Day Lewis. Okay. Yeah, with the screenplay written by somebody from Lake Charles. Believe it. Or really, not. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Kushner, Tony Kushner, wrote huh. that screenplay. And he's well, from that's like an Charles. interesting, thing and it know. was it was interesting because he char- he um, he he didn't pick the he didn't pick something that was more. He picked how to th- think rather than one of the great dramatic things. It was how he dealt with a particular problem, and I would love to 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 talk with him because uh, you know so much is. Um, of, of the United States history is dependent on on the interactions between what happened in the Civil War and just before, just after, and uh, it's uh, it would be nice to talk to hear Abraham's viewpoint. Yeah, there. boy, you're talking about being dead center of that, dead yeah, center that of the be... issue. You know, because it, it it becomes a little bit of an issue for me. You know, living in the South and having had ancestors that probably had slaves, uh, you know, I, so far I haven't been able to find any that did because we were poor Cajuns. But, but uh, there's some possibility back then. You wonder about about the, the 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 relationship of how that actually worked, how people could actually justify that in terms of, of an economic. It had to happen, according to you know the, the South. It had to happen, and I'm wondering why it had to happen, because in another five or six years we had a, a complete change with the the the, the uh, changes with the steam power this, right, that, you right. know, and all the equipment that uh, agricultural renovations and revolution just after the civil war when you didn't have to have uh, it's interesting so that's yeah. right i mean technology so much it, it, it's it easy to know all oh, technologies are bad and yeah you know, so the, that, that so that and that you know that argument is is moot yeah uh, because things were 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 changing at that point so it would be interesting to get a abraham lincoln's viewpoint that is a on that. very interesting answer yeah there you are well that I, I i tell you that that kind of stuff like that really gets you thinking you know Every, it does some, sometimes people pick some kind of cheeky character no you know but really to get deep deep dive into somebody that's like really at the the crux of uh history well it, it really the crux of history the crux of history the the actual point at, at which the defining character of the united states was created as far as i'm concerned uh because it, it, it pretty much everything that follows becomes you know connected with that event yeah now what can we do people like me you know to help with the protection of visible landmarks in the you know in southwest Louisiana. well one thing is that uh, is to, to widen your concept of what a landmark is uh because landmarks are not necessarily uh you know old or, or fancy they can be uh, regular it might be it might be something as as modest as uh, make a decision not to tear something down, but to find a good, another use for it. Yeah. And if you're a business person, uh, there there are some really good reasons for that. Sometimes uh, an adaptive reuse project is a little bit less expensive than a complete new rebuild, particularly if you have to drag in a lot of dirt in order to elevate the property or do something else to modify the way it's, it's done. Um, so if, if you're a business person and you're looking for new digs for your business, look around your community 
opportunity at a place that is underused or uh, that is ab- abandoned and see if it can be revived for for current use. It's a good idea to look at resources. It's good stewardship uh, of, of existing resources to reuse what you already have rather than to rebuild from scratch. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it doesn't have to be big. It, it can be something uh, as modest or as modern as, for example, when when Albertsons and Sulphur left and Kroger's moved in. Unfortunately, Kroger's had just built a new building too. But the thing is, when Kroger's left, somebody else went into that building. So right, it doesn't it's become a dead property. Yeah, don't uh, keep the properties occupied and useful, and consider maintaining your property as much as you, you possibly can. Because uh, uh, you know, one of the underlying themes of this this podcast is that we live in a part of the country where. Uh, the environment is is deadly on buildings. I mean, uh, uh, we're, we're dealing with rain, we're dealing with termites, we're dealing with mold, we're dealing with all sorts of things, high winds, and that means that you have to build to a little, slightly higher standard if you're expecting to to adaptively reuse it. And uh, so, we as uh, as citizens, we as business owners, we as as uh, people who are in the community um, need to to support businesses that do adaptively reuse structures if they can, if you can if you have you know instead of going to some somebody that's cut down all sorts of uh, uh cut down all sorts of trees in order to build a, 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 a to put up a a, a tin building and you have them or you have somebody that's been in business for 60 years in the same location maintaining their property well you know, if you can make the choice go to go to one or the other yeah uh it uh, adaptive reuse and that is not those are good words adaptive yeah. reuse is something love that, that. yeah it, adaptive reuse is good stewardship of resources and you know the 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 deal yeah, adaptive re- and that's that's a decision that you can make. You can make a decision to to adaptively reuse something uh, if you can. Um, and remember that our history in Southwest Louisiana is v- we're a very young part of the country, very very young, and that means that things that are fifty years old are old. <laughs> Particularly when you're looking at Southwest Louisiana, you know a lot of our history is what we would call mid-century. It's last century, yeah. Uh, but it, it, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, granted, it's not necessarily the prettiest of architecture. But you can redo the exteriors of buildings, and you can use the good bones that you have. Ah, yeah. Don't don't be off put by something. Um, uh, we're also real keen on trying to keep trees in place. Yes. Uh, we're big tree huggers. We were uh, talking about this on the last episode. Yeah, I had Irvin yeah, Luke on here. Yeah. And um, he said the same thing. You know, trees are great uh, storm barriers. Really. They are. I mean, they bring the they're, water up into the atmosphere and get it out right. of the ground. It, it, they, they're extremely important. It helps to moderate the climate. It uh, And frankly, uh, uh, tree, there is no better example of that than on an August day. If there are any trees in the parking lot, there are cars underneath the, the yeah. trees. Nothing breaks my heart. I mean, it's just the absolute truth. Nothing breaks my heart worse than when I see that there's a commercial property for sale in front of a piece of property that has big, beautiful, old live oaks. Yeah. It just kills me because I know yeah. what's coming. The, you know? the live oaks, particularly, are living treasures like the Sabine Lighthouse. They are symbols of southwest Louisiana. Live oaks don't grow everywhere. Live oaks are are important parts of our history, particularly here, because most live oaks, uh, uh, except maybe things like the, the Sally Oak and a couple of odd things like that, were probably planted by men and women who were pioneers in this area. A lot of live oaks were used as marker uh, uh, trees. They marked the edges of property. Mm. That's why you have alleys of live oaks. Even in the country, you'll see alleys of live Like in Chupeak, there are live oaks. There yeah. are live oaks uh, between here and De Quincey. And you'll see lines of live oaks. Those are not naturally occurring. Those are actually planted by man. And they planted live oaks because live oaks are extremely resilient to weather and they're ideal for our climate. So live oaks are really living treasures as far as I'm concerned and uh, they, they really get zero respect. They get zero respect in Lake Charles they get zero respect in a lot of places um, when the interst- when the, the precursor to the interstate highways, the United States Federal Highway System, Highway 90 Highway 90 when it was designed 
Highway 190, when it was designed, Highway 71, when it was designed, they were designed to have trees, oak trees on both sides yeah, of the road. Yeah, that's right. They covered them. They covered it. And the reason was that that back then they figured that you're going to be driving in an unair conditioned car. If you have to change the tire, <laughs> you want to change it in the shade. If you want to drive cool and comfortable, that was your air conditioning to have live oaks. And we have a few live oaks along Highway 90. Uh, uh, yeah, we have some here in Sulphur yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And those trees are absolutely as far as I'm concerned specifically uh, monuments uh, in South Louisiana because the as I understand the history of the highway department a fellow by the name a like Charles person by the name of Tarbert Slack and that's a name to conjure with Slack mm -hmm. Tarbert Slack was the the brainstorm for that he had he had served in the um, he had served in the army, as I understand, and had seen that the Romans planted trees along the Roman roads uh, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Interesting. For the same reason that Tarbert Slack said, we ought to plant trees along the, the U.S. highways in order to provide shade for our... Uh, for our, our motoring public. And so, and Tarbert was a native of South Louisiana, South Louisiana. Isn't that the, the gravity of history? Yeah. I mean, to go, you can take those trees right here on Highway 9. Right. Draw a line to him, and then his inspiration comes from 2,000 years, years ago, ago in with the Romans. Rome. That's incredible. You see, but that's, that's the thing. That's incredible. That's, if, if, if you're a generalist, I'm a history generalist. So, you know, I can tell you a little bit about 17th century France. I can tell you a little bit about this. I can tell you a little bit about a lot. But I can tell you a lot about Southwest Louisiana. And the thing is, there are... There are models and examples in history that sort of shape your your environment, and as far as as here, uh, you know, I see shapes and patterns all the time. Yeah, you know, and I try to make connections, and that's yeah. that's uh, what a good historian does is that make those connections. Yeah. So if, when you see an oak tree, if you ever have your you know if you ever have to change a tire on Highway 90, change it under one of Tarbert Slack's Roman. That's incredible. Inspired trees you know it's interesting because uh i love drawing lines between each person i've had on the show in a similar way and i love that how sometimes I, I just see them sort of echoing each other you know urban luke was here and we were talking about this and he was talking about ecology is the study of relationships mm. between things and i i always bring up this zen buddhist monk that i love to read named thick not han and he uses the word interbeing he said nothing is um not dependent on something oh, else everything is just all, a combination right and listening to you talk about that too that's exactly what you're describing mm -hmm. the, the connections between things i mean mm -hmm. nothing is in is depend is no you're, no man is an island really yeah. and and, and it, even though you're we're here we're in southwest louisiana it's 2019 we have connections back to the romans in the way trees were planted along the the highways yeah who would have thought who would have thought who would have thought I have one more question and it's on the back of this yellow coffee mug and that's your coffee mug by the way it's on the other side did anything good happen today yeah. Yeah, the best thing that happened is that I came to talk with Oren Parker. Man, that's fantastic. Yeah. I braved the crossing I of the Calcasieu to come. You didn't have to take a ferry or didn't ride have on to take a log. Ferry or walk on logs. <laughs> I didn't have to take the, the hazel and a mule. And that was the good thing that happened today. Man, that's great to hear. I'm glad because, you know, that's what I want from this show is there's so many good things going on around us. It's so easy to get overwhelmed in the, in the tidal wave of uh, you and I had this before we even started recording, uh, elevating the conversation, right? right? Having elevated discourse, elevated discourse is yeah. what we need. Yeah. Let me see here. I'm getting past a note. Adley's grasp of our timeline. What does that mean to you? Well, Melinda likes... My wife is with us right here. She's been very quiet, but she's been writing on her hand most of the time. <laughs> uh, uh, Melinda claims that I have a timeline in my brain that has all these little offshoots. And if you pick a spot, I can go from that spot to like 15 other different spots uh -huh. of the timeline to, to, to... His grasp of our history, all the way back to dinosaurs to today. <laughs> well, not so much dinosaurs. <laughs> we didn't have dinosaurs. We didn't have dinosaurs here. 
uh, grasp of our time, yeah. Southwest Louisiana, and how it connects to the rest of the world. Sure. It's fabulous, and it's one of the gifts of listening yeah. to him talk about history, is that thing that, that takes you from way back when to now, is a, is his brain is a long timeline. And it's it's a pleasure to listen to it is. and talk because he can interweave things that we think of separate uh, events into the pattern of our history. Well, you know that day that I took that ride with you, and I mean that may not have been a spectacular day, particularly for you, but when I came back from that, I it stuck with me all these years. And uh, when I started this show, I said eventually I'm going to try to get Adley on the show because that was a conversation that I never got to have again, and I haven't had one since. You know, and it's a shame because we we live in a fascinating part of the the country. We take it for granted. We just drive through, you know. But I, I when when I when as we drive back to Lake Charles, uh, we're going to round that corner uh, and uh, we'll look at Bilbo Cemetery, and I'll think, yeah. oh well, this is Bilbo Cemetery. This is where Canton and Atkinson was located. This is where the you make all these little connections. You know, it's 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 a rare game. It, well, it's a rare, but it's also kind of annoying at sometimes because you start thinking, you know, I should really be paying attention. To my driving. <laughs> no, I am, he's the navigator. I'm the driver. Yeah. Anytime I say, what about that over there? It's like a pop up book of our region's history it opens up because he has a grip on that. And it's yeah. wonderful for you to invite him here because we get to benefit from that encyclopedic knowledge that yeah. he has of our history. I, I agree. There are two things that come to mind. One is another podcast that I really enjoy listening to with uh, Mike Rowe, and he, he has a podcast called The Way I Heard It. Mm -hmm. And that podcast in and of itself is an homage, as he admitted, admits in the first episode, to Paul Harvey's old uh, show. And both of those things, uh, Paul Harvey, when I was a kid, was somebody I used to love to listen to. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to love the way he would tell a story and then wrap it up at the end in the big reveal of what you were actually right. hearing the history yeah. of. Yeah. And, you know, Mike's trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's just wonderful because you don't realize what you just, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what, that's exactly yeah. right. You don't know what you that's don't exactly know. That's exactly right. It's, uh, it's, it, and there are so many examples of how that works if you know the context that it's in. Um, um, I can go from Baptist orphans to streetcars. And you think, okay, Baptist Service Cars. Well, uh, in 1899, the Louisiana Baptist Convention decided that Lake Charles would be the ideal place to have an orphanage. And I'm talking about an old Victorian style orphanage with wards and, you know, uh, uh, matrons and all that sort of uh -huh. thing. And Lake Charles was chosen at the time because Lake Charles was the place that they thought they could r renew these kids and turn them into good little farmers and good little housewives and good, you know, productive people by teaching them this sort of thing. And so there were farms. There was a, an actual barn set up and they had cows and the little Baptist orphans were taught to be farmers and printers and uh, a number of other there were bakers there were several occupations that they were actually trained to do uh, the site that was located was uh, off 7th Street between 7th and 9th and uh, Bank and Kirkman Street in Lake Charles and uh, it, it functioned there for quite a long time it was about uh, almost 30 years and uh, eventually a Baptist family in Monroe Louisiana decided to give even more land in Monroe and so the Baptist orphanage was shut down in Lake Charles well the Baptist orphanage was adaptively reused it was purchased by a woman named um, Landry. Okay. Mrs. Mrs. Landry, uh, uh, J.A. Landry. Her husband had died suddenly, uh, unexpectedly. And um, her husband, Jay Landry, was the major stockholder in the streetcar company in Lake Charles. <laughs> the one you'd mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah, the one we mentioned yeah. earlier. And uh, Jay Landry had extremely ambitious plans for the streetcar. He was going to expand it. It was going to, he was eventually going to run the streetcar all the way to New Iberia, Louisiana, and we're going to have daily service from Lake Charles to New Iberia. Can you imagine? On, on a streetcar line. And it was going to pick up people in Bell City. It was going to pick up people in, in uh, all, all the way down. So it was going to change the entire fabric of Southwest Louisiana. Unfortunately, Jay had died. Uh, Mrs. Landry was absolutely distraught, and she decided to buy the vacant orphanage and give it to the Christian brothers, the Catholic Christian brothers, to turn into a boys' school. It became okay. J.A. Landry Memorial High School for Boys. Wow. Okay. Then, uh, many years later, J.A. Landry 
St. Charles Academy, which was the girls' Catholic school, and Sacred Heart High School, which was the black Catholic high school in town, merged to form St. Louis High School. Interesting. So you have an interesting connection between Louisiana Baptists, streetcars, and a Catholic high school in southwest Louisiana. Now, isn't that an odd line? Yeah, and you know, Adley, I've just got, you know, I'm in advertising, and I'm always having creative ideas. You could have your own show <laughs> that has, just like this fishbowl that just has single topics that are un- seemingly unrelated, that where you draw to, and then the whole you have episode to make is you <laughs> making the connections. What an interesting show that would be. It would be a fascinating show. I would, I'm, I'm wondering if it would actually work beyond the first show, but it would be an interesting <laughs> show. Because it is true. There are some really odd connections in Lake Charles. There are some particularly odd connections uh, in southwest Louisiana. Not just Lake Charles. Southwest Louisiana. It's a strange part of the country to be from. It's a fascinating part of the country to be from. And with that... With that, we got to. We've, we're going to have to wind this up. No, sometime. that's good. That's good. Actually, that's a great place to put a pin. And honestly, uh, I hope that maybe someday you'll come back. And we can have another conversation. Sometime we'll cross the Calcasieu. Maybe on a new bridge. Yeah, we'll cross right, the Cal- right. We'll cross Wouldn't the Calcasieu. But uh, you're you would be worth crossing the Calcasieu even if I had to walk on logs. I had fun. I really did. This is this was round two for me. You know, like I said, I only got a taste that day for the historic tour, and we didn't go anywhere into the territory that we went mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would encourage people to. I mean, and now you said you give tours just to wrap it up. I mean, so how people get in touch with you to do that type of stuff? What's the best? Well, uh, I, I actually work through the Convention Visitors Bureau. They are the ones. That okay, actually so they're the ones. Yeah, they're the ones who actually schedule it. Uh, most of the time, it's a step on type thing where I will walk on, you know, step onto a bus and actually do the um uh you know do a tour over a set route occasionally somebody will privately engage me to do i did a private tour for the the wife of the uh the uh, uh president of sitco one day i was doing it in english and she was getting it in spanish through an interpreter it was interesting uh so it, uh, it occasionally does happen that way uh but uh, generally the commission visitors bureau is the one who uh, is very good at promoting the history of southwest louisiana and exploring the history of southwest louisiana and so I want to plug them too if I can. They're one of our bigger clients, and I enjoy working with them. That's how I connected with you the first time. But then the other thing that I want to talk about just really quickly is your book, Lost Lake Charles. Lost Lake Charles, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Lost Lake Charles, uh, it's a, a, an actual published book. Uh, you can get it at Amazon. You can get okay. it locally. Uh, just type in Lost Lake Charles and you can find it. Uh, it's available in a hard copy, paperback. I think there's even an ebook now. I wish uh, I'd have bought a hard copy. Yeah, I didn't know I yeah, got the paperback. Uh, yeah, uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, it's been, uh, it's now in its second or third reprint. So it's oh, good. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I was really happy to hear that. Although, to be very honest, um, uh, one of the things, an interesting little sidelight um my wife's first husband uh the late myron mcfillan uh his aunt was nola may ross oh really a pioneer writer in southwest louisiana a a great gal a great gal uh and um she uh towards the end i was the uh, i was the relative that helped her schlep her books around and i said (laughs) i never wanted to self-publish she self-published and uh when you self-publish it means that you take on the cost of getting it produced and so forth and and you take the advantage of of selling them but you actually have to sell them i'm happy to have a a national distributor or uh, it's a history book uh, history book company uh, Arcadia um, uh, print they have the Lost Lake Charles uh, uh, they're my publisher and they're the ones that are getting it out there and making it available so my uh, opinion Lost Lake Charles required reading for anybody who lives in Lake Charles that's maybe not from Lake Charles mm-hmm. and doesn't even if you do live here yeah yeah you know it, it's it's the history of the area it, and it's yeah. Lost Lake Charles but it could just as easily be lost southwest Louisiana yeah absolutely yeah you're, you're gonna see things and, and honestly you've got a, a bunch of great Great photography in here too that people yeah, are probably I, not going to be yeah, familiar uh, with. One of the things that we're real lucky with in Southwest Louisiana is that we have a fabulous archives at McNeese State University. Plug to them, plug to to uh, Patty Three, who is their archivist there. Uh, she's a, a local uh, uh, person who understands the history. Uh, the uh, collection of images is phenomenal. We have a phenomenal image. And the other big plug is to the archives of the American Press newspaper, American Press newspaper, and its predecessor papers uh, have been digitized so you can actually see you can pull up if you want to know what the life was like on the in southwest louisiana
Louisiana the day you were born. You can actually go to McNeese Archive to uh, uh, the archives of the newspaper and pull it up, and you can actually see the paper from that wow. day, which is phenomenal. It's not that way everywhere in the United States. Uh, big plugs to them, and a big uh, thumbs up to the Southwest Louisiana Genealogical and Historical Library. Uh, we have fabulous resources for checking out your history in Southwest Louisiana, and a big plug to them. The Calcutta Parish Library System has a whole branch that deals with history. Anybody listening to this episode needs to have a pen and paper ready to write all this stuff down. Yeah, really. Because really, there is so much information you can enjoy so much about the history of this area just from listening to this one conversation. Sounds great. It's exactly right. Man, well, my answer to what's on the back of that mug is this was also something good that happened to me today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love you just as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of Find the Good News. If you would like to advertise on this show or sponsor an episode, just visit findthegood.news. Send me a message and we'll see about getting your business, organization, service, product, or event on the show. I deeply thank each of you again for supporting this podcast.